Investigating the Collapse of FTX, Part One. I now recognize myself for five minutes to give an opening statement. First, I'd like to welcome Mr. John Ray III, who has been appointed CEO of FTX to oversee its bankruptcy, to testify before our committee for the first part of our investigation into the fall of FTX. I am hopeful that the arrest of Mr. Bankman Freed, the founder and former CEO of FTX, means he will be held accountable for the fraud he has committed and the harm he has caused. He was scheduled to testify under oath before this committee today. Unfortunately, the timing of his arrest denies the public the opportunity to get the answers they deserve. Rest assured that this committee will not stop until we uncover the full truth behind the collapse of FTX. Just a few months ago, FTX was one of the largest cryptocurrency exchanges in the world with a valuation of $32 billion in just three years since its founding. Today, FTX is bankrupt and possibly looted. FTX misused an, an approximately $10 billion in customer funds and owes creditors at least $3 billion. Today, as many as 1 million people, many of whom are here in the United States, are locked out of their FTX accounts and may recover only a fraction of their hard-earned investments, if any at all. But this failure is not just noteworthy for its size, but for the company's total disregard for standard business practices, governance, risk management, and criminal conduct. Mr. Ray, who also oversaw one of the largest corporate bankruptcies in United States history, Enron, declared that he had never in his career seen such, and I quote, complete failure of corporate controls and such a complete absence of trustworthy financial information as occurred here, end of quote. I'm so deeply troubled to learn how common it was for Bankman Freed and FTX employees to steal from the cookie jar of customer funds to finance their lavish lifestyles. Today, this committee will dig deeper into Mr. Ray's findings with the hopes of piecing together the events that led to the collapse of FTX and the subsequent harm to millions of customers who put their trust in the platform. We will also look at FTX's deep ties with Alameda, a crypto hedge fund predominantly owned by Bankman Freed that gambled away billions of dollars in customer assets that were inappropriately transferred from FTX. And importantly, we will hear how Mr. Ray and his team are trying to recover funds for customers by piecing together Bankman Freed's broken record keeping and by identifying potentially unlawful transfers to himself as well as his friends and family. <clears throat> Under my leadership over the past four years, this committee has closely focused on the growth and popularity of crypto precisely because of the many concerns that the failure of FTX has highlighted. Last year, I created a digital assets working group comprised of Democratic members of the committee with the goal of learning more about the underlying technologies, applications for finance, and the risk they pose to customers, consumers, and the economy. When the President's Working Group on Financial Markets urged Congress to safeguard the economy from stablecoin risk, I and Ranking Member McHenry jumped into action and continued to work on a bill with the members of this committee. The ongoing failures of crypto firms like Terra USD, Celsius, BlockFi, and most SIFT significantly FTX and Alameda Research only serves to strengthen the importance for Congress and the public to understand the harm caused to customers. What laws have been broken or flaunted and how Congress and the regulators can prevent this from happening again. I want to say that I'm pleased that the committee's efforts have pushed enforcement agencies across the country to take greater action against bad actors who misuse customers' funds. I also applaud the SEC for authorizing 
separate charges relating to Mr. Bankman Freed, and I look forward to additional actions to hold him accountable and make customers more whole again. I yield back. And I now recognize the ranking member of the committee, the gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. McHenry, for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. We've heard everything but the truth. Tweets, DMs, and interviews are no substitute for the facts. And that's why Chairwoman Waters and I worked together to get this hearing on the books, the first bipartisan hearing uh, of this committee in the last four years. Uh, and we've worked together to invite two witnesses. One, Mr. Ray, is proven to be a reliable witness. The second, well, um, frankly, I look forward to getting his lies here on the record under oath. Um, nevertheless, the arrest of Sam Bankman Freed is welcome news. Uh, but it still does not get to the bottom of what happened at FTX and why it, it happened and who else may be responsible. We need to understand the flow of funds between FTX and Alameda Research and the 130 related entities. We need to examine the actions of those who may have contributed to what has been called a, quote, complete failure of corporate controls, end quote. Uh, that quote comes from Mr. Ray, the newly appointed CEO. And we need to answer, we need answers uh, for uh, the U.S. platform customers stuck in limbo. But our work here, um, that, well, our work doesn't stop there. Uh, we have an obligation to do everything in our power to ensure this never happens again. But let's face it, there's an old saying, there's nothing new under the sun. And it's safe to assume that fraud and fraudsters have been around just as long as that phrase has been around. Bankman Freed's play is nothing new. We've, we've seen it before. Uh, in the late 1800s, when the Union Pacific purposefully inflated the price of railway, railroad construction to line its executive pockets, or in the 1900s, when the con man George C. Parker was arrested for illegally, quote unquote, selling the Brooklyn Bridge, Madison Square Garden, the Statue of Liberty. And in the 2000s, when it was revealed Enron engaged in a massive corporate fraud and corruption, sending shockwaves throughout the business world. Uh, there are many comparisons you can draw between each one of these pretenders and the alleged actions of Mr. Bankman Freed. It appears to be the same old school fraud, just using new technology. But it's important to note, and I think it's very important to note, we still use railroads, we still buy and sell real estate, and we still rely on businesses to provide services. We have to separate out the bad actions of an individual from the good created by an industry and an innovation. So let me be clear. I believe in the promise of digital assets and those around the world building on blockchain technologies. And that's why I've worked and will continue to work to provide clear rules of the road for the digital asset ecosystem here in the United States. And that's how we protect American consumers and investors in this marketplace and allow innovation to occur here in the United States. I'll finish with this. We know the Securities Exchange Commission Chair Gensler's regulation by enforcement approach is not gonna stop bad actors. Next year, I look forward to hearing from Mr. Gensler early and often. And we'll hear from him on how we can provide clarity on the application of our securities laws to trading platforms, which he has failed to do. The Financial Services Committee has an important role to play in this fact-finding mission, which we will start today and continue as we work towards a legislative outcome to prevent this from happening again. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I yield back. I want to welcome our witness for this hearing, John J. Ray III, who is the Chief Executive Officer of XTX Group. Without objection, your written statement will be made part of the record. You will have five minutes to present your oral testimony. You should be able to see a timer that will indicate how much time you have left. I would ask you to be mindful of the timer so that we can be respectful of everyone's time. Mr. Ray, you are now recognized for five minutes to present your oral testimony. 
Chairwoman Waters, Ranking Member McHenry, distinguished members of the committee, thank you for your invitation to appear today. I truly appreciate your interest in this matter, and I hope my testimony can be helpful to you as the committee continues its inquiry into the collapse of FTX and the efforts that are underway to help those who have been harmed. I accepted the position of Chief Executive Officer of FTX in the early morning hours of November 11. Immediately it became clear to me that Chapter 11 was the best course available to preserve any remaining value of FTX. Therefore, my first act as CEO was to authorize the Chapter 11 filings. I've implemented a five-part bankruptcy plan, which is detailed in my written statement. Our overarching objective is to maximize value for FTX customers and creditors so that we can mitigate to the greatest extent possible the harm suffered by so many. The FTX group's collapse appears to stem from absolute concentration of control in the hands of a small group of grossly inexperienced, non-sophisticated individuals who failed to implement virtually any of the systems or controls that are necessary for a company entrusted with other people's money or assets. Some of the unacceptable management practices have identified so far include the use of computer infrastructure that gave individuals and senior management access to systems that stored customer assets without security controls to prevent them from redirecting those assets. The storing of certain private keys to access hundreds of millions of dollars in crypto assets without effective security controls or encryption. The ability of Alameda to borrow funds held at FTX.com to be utilized for its own trading or investments without any effective limits whatsoever. The commingling of assets, the lack of complete documentation for transactions involving nearly 500 separate investments made with FTX group funds and assets. In the absence of audited or reliable financial statements, the lack of personnel and financial and risk management functions, and the absence of independent governance throughout the FTX group. The fundamental challenge we face is that we're in many respects starting from near zero in terms of the corporate infrastructure and record keeping that one would expect in a multi billion dollar corporation. Still, in just over four weeks, we've instituted meaningful steps to gain command and control, and every week, we gain a better understanding of what occurred and the path forward, all of which will be shared with interested parties and affected parties throughout the Chapter 11 processes. The scope of our, of our investigation is truly enormous. It involves detailed tracing of money flows and asset transfers from the time of FTX's founding and complex technological efforts to identify and trace crypto assets. We are in the process of collecting and reviewing dozens of terabytes of documents and data, including billions of individual transactions. We're leveraging sophisticated technology and expertise to identify and trace additional transactions and assets. While many things are unknown at this stage, we're at a very preliminary stage, uh, many questions remain. We know the following. First, customer assets at FTX.com were commingled with assets from the Alameda trading platform. That much is clear. Second, Alameda used client funds to engage in margin trading, which exposed customer funds to massive losses. Third, the FTX group went on a spending binge in 2021, 2022, during which $5 billion was spent on a myriad of businesses and investments, many of which may only be worth a fraction of what was paid for them. Fourth, loans and other payments were made to insiders in excess of $1.5 billion. Fifth, Alameda's business model as a market maker required funds to be deployed to various third-party exchanges, which were inherently unsafe and further exacerbated by the limited protections offered in certain of those foreign jurisdictions. I know the resolution of the Chapter 11 process, as well as the investigation and the causes of the FTX group's collapse, are of keen interest to this committee and to your constituents. Although, you know, there are many who need and deserve answers. There's customers, there's creditors, there's investors, counterparties, employees, and regulators. We're positioning ourselves to provide each of these constituents with answers that they deserve. Although a bankruptcy proceeding of this unprecedented nature will take some time to run its course, 
Uh, I'm committed to working as quickly as possible to investigate what happened, formulate conclusions, and hopefully inform the committee's work here. I should note that my ability to comment on certain of the matters today will be inherently limited by the state of FTX's records, ongoing bankruptcy proceedings, and of course the numerous ongoing investigations by the U.S. law enforcement regulators. I look forward to answering your questions to the best of my ability. Uh, thank you again for allowing me to uh, present in front of this committee. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Ray, it has been widely reported how FTX shifted customer funds held at the exchange to Alameda Research, which was a hedge fund owned almost entirely by Mr. Bankman Freed. This allowed the firm to effectively gamble with customer money uh, without their knowledge or consent. If FTX was registered as a securities exchange, several laws would have required the segregation of customer assets and prevented such clear conflicts of interest. Mr. Bankman Freed also appears to have tried to hide the linkages between the exchange and his hedge fund. Have you seen evidence of such a cover-up? Have you seen evidence that there was any independent governance of Alameda separate and apart from that of the exchange? The, op the operations of the XTF group were not segregated. Uh, it was really operated as one company. Uh, as a result, there's no distinction virtually uh, between the operations of the company and who controlled those operations. Well, <clears throat> Mr. Ray, another bankruptcy filing revealed that Mr. Bankman Freed personally received $1 billion, a $1 billion loan from Alameda Research. In a meeting with committee staff, Mr. Bankman Freed was unaware of the terms of the repayment, interest details, and could not confidently state who authorized the loan. He claimed that he reinvested this money into the exchange, but knowingly chose to have the loan issued to him rather than FTX to avoid directly connecting Alameda Research to FTX. Can you elaborate on any significant findings in connection with this loan? The, the loans that were given to Mr. Uh, Bankman Freed uh, were not just one loan, it was numerous loans, uh, some of which were documented uh, by individual promissory notes. Uh, there's no description of uh, what the purpose of the loan was. Uh, in one sense, in instance, uh, he, he signed both as the issuer of the loan as well as the recipient of the loan. Uh, but we have no information at this time as to what the purpose or the use of those funds were, and that is part of our investigation. Did you find any business or operational activities that the ent entities jointly engaged in that you would consider inappropriate or detrimental to FTX? If so, could you give us an example? Oh, certainly, thank you. Uh, the, you know, the operation of, uh, of Alameda really depended, uh, based on the way it was operated, for the use of customer funds. That, that's the major breakdown here. Uh, funds from FTX.com, which was the exchange for uh, non-US citizens, uh, those funds were used at Alameda to make investments and other disbursements. Did FTX have sufficient risk management systems and controls to appropriately monitor any leverage the business took on and the interconnections it had with businesses like, again, Alameda? There were virtually no internal controls and no separateness whatsoever. With that, I'm going to um, call on the gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. McHenry, who is a ranking member of the committee. You are now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Mr. Ray, uh, thank you for your testimony. Um, 
we had uh, your predecessor, Mr. Sam Bangman fried before this committee a year ago. Um, and given, given where we are, can we just start from the beginning? Um, you have in your declarations uh, some clear outlines, but I want to make sure we have this in the record. Uh, there are different groups of businesses under the FTX, FTX platform um, or umbrella. Your declarations separate the businesses into four silos. We describe that. Yes, uh, for structural purposes and just for ease of presentation, we tried to take the over 100 entities and we put those in four silos. Uh, to demystify that, it's very simple. There was a U.S. silo, which was the FTX U.S. exchange for U.S. Uh, investors. Uh, there was an international exchange called FTX.com, again, for uh, non-U.S. Uh, persons that uh, invested uh, in crypto. Uh, there was Alameda, which is purely a crypto hedge fund, which made other investments, venture capital type investments. Then there's a fourth entity, which was purely investments. And although our investigation is not complete, uh, those, those investments were most likely made with either Alameda money or money that originally came from FTX.com. But that fourth silo is just purely investments. And who owned those four silos? All, all those entities were you know, owned or controlled uh, by Sam Bankman Fried. Okay. Um, and so can you describe the differences between the FTX.com and FTX US silos? Yes. Uh, very simply, you know, FTX US was for US citizens who wanted to trade crypto. Uh, FTX.com uh, was for, uh, you know, you know, was, U.S. citizens were not allowed to trade on, on that exchange. Uh, that's very simple. And I would make one other comment, which is separate and apart from uh, uh, any of those two silos, uh, it was Ledger X, which is a regulated entity regulated by the CFTC, solvent and separate from the FTX U.S. silo. Okay. And that, that is a distinct silo. That's a distinct um, company. That was a distinct company within the U.S. silo, yes. Okay. So then Alameda Research and the venture capital businesses, what did Alameda Re Research do? Uh, essentially made crypto investments, uh, engaged in you know, margin trading, you know, took long and short positions in crypto, essentially invested in crypto. But of course, we now know also invested in over $5 billion of uh, other assets, which are in a variety of, of sectors. And what was the practice between Alameda Research and FTX.com? Do you have, have you established any, anything you can disclose to us today? In, in essence, you know, Alameda uh, was a, a user, uh, effectively a customer of FTX.com. Uh, that's how it was essentially structured. Uh, was that a distinct set of capital between those two uh, companies? Well, we now know the answer to that is no. No. Okay. Um, and with the information you have right now, uh, when, when approximately did FTX begin to experience financial trouble? Uh, well, it was first disclosed uh, to the public you know, beginning around November 2nd. Uh, but, you know, when this began uh, was months, if not, you know, earlier years, our investigation is is continuing, this is, but this is not something that happened overnight or in the context of a week. Okay, uh, so you, you said the distinction between FTX US, FTX.com, Alameda Research. What was, a re, what was the relationship between FTX.com and FTX US? Was, was there a distinction between the two? Uh, there was a public distinction between the two. Uh, what we're seeing though is that the crypto assets for both FTX.com and for FTX US, you know, we're housed in the same database. It's called the AWS system, which is just an acronym for Amazon Web Services. It was it, it all housed in the same uh, web format. And is that distinct from Alameda's um, assets? Yes, it is. Okay. Um, so in, in your testimony, you said that there is, quote, an absence of independent governance throughout the FTX group, end quote. Uh, yet, Mr. Bankman Freed has said that, quote, he wasn't running Alameda or making decisions on the Alameda side, uh, end quote. I is this an accurate statement uh, by Mr. I, I assume you're going to say your statement's accurate. Is Mr. Bankman Freed's statement accurate? 
I, I don't know the basis for his comment. I, I will note that he owned ninety percent of Alameda. So, but you've seen that you've seen no distinction in governance between the two. Oh, absolutely not. There's no distinction whatsoever. Uh, the owners of the company could really run free reign across all four silos. Thank you for testimony. The gentlewoman from New York, Mrs. Velasquez, who is also the chair of the House Committee on Small Business, is now recognized for five minutes. Good morning, Mr. Ray. Um, you have long, you have had a long career working, working on several high-profile bankruptcies, most notably the Enron debacle. Mr. Ray, you were recently quoted in the New York Times as saying you have never seen such a complete failure of corporate control, and the level of dysfunction was the worst you have ever seen. Can you expand on these statements and what you have seen since taking over a CEO to make uh, such a remark? Uh, yes, thank you. Th th that comment uh, it went to really uh, you know, one thing that we found, which you know, every case is different. Uh, the challenges of every case is different. Uh, the issue here that I was speaking to is I've just never seen an utter lack of uh, record keeping. Uh, absolutely no internal controls whatsoever. And uh, of course, this case is then made difficult in that context uh, when you're dealing with technology. Mr. Ray, a number of debtors in the FTX group are located in offshore jurisdictions. Will this complicate the efforts to retrieve the assets of those debtors? If so, why? Uh, no, I, it, it, I don't think it will complicate it at all. Uh, the various jurisdictions historically in bankruptcy, and I've been in a number of cross-border situations, uh, the jurisdictions uh, will cooperate with each other. Uh, the regulators in all these jurisdictions, uh, I think, realize that uh, everyone's there for a common purpose to uh, protect the victims and to recover uh, assets for uh, the victims of, of these situations. Have, uh, how much have you been able to secure and where are most of these uh, assets located? Uh, we, we've been able to, to secure, you know, over a billion dollars of assets. Uh, we've secured those to uh, cold wallets in a secure location. Uh, it's an ongoing process, though, uh, which, uh, which will, will, will take, you know, weeks and perhaps months to secure all of the assets. Are most uh, predators located in the U.S. or foreign jurisdictions? The majority of the creditors uh, trade through the dot-com silo and are outside of uh, this jurisdiction, although there are some foreign uh, customers that are on the U.S. silo uh, and vice versa. So it is my understanding you establish four silos. Can you uh, explain why you believe establishing these silos and taking this approach will maximize asset recovery, recovery for uh, creditors? And do you think this approach could help determine what happened to the $1 billion that is gone missing? Uh, yes. Uh, so one of the reasons why we set up the silos the way we did was to first focus on you know, the, the FTX silo for the U.S. It's a relatively smaller uh, trading volume, uh, fewer users. Uh, it's truly meant you know, to be for the U.S. customers. The dot-com silo is really for, uh, for non-U.S. customers, so there's a logical reason why we separated those two out. Uh, the Alameda Fund, well, that's just the fund that, you know, that drew resources from the exchanges. So it's, it's really separate. It was not for customers, per se. It was just simply a hedge fund. Um, as we here in Congress consider the possibility of legislation in this area, what is the one thing that you have seen in your short amount of time at FTX that you will urge us to keep in mind or is needed the most? Uh, you know, I, I, I don't want to speak to, to you know, detailed regulations or make observations about regulations. That's certainly not an area of my expertise. However, uh, we're dealing with people's money and their assets. And, you know, my basic observation is you need records, you need controls, 
and and you need to segregate people's money. That's Thank a, you. That's simple. Thank you. Madam Chair, I yield back. The gentlewoman from Missouri, Mrs. Wagner, is now recognized for five minutes. I uh, thank you, Madam Chairwoman, and I thank you, Mr. Ray, for being here for the work that you're doing. Mr. Ray, you have compared FTX as worse than Enron. Can you please elaborate on some of the specific ways FTX is worse than one of the largest corporate frauds in history? The, the FTX group is unusual in the sense that, you know, I've done probably a, a dozen large, you know, scale bankruptcies over my career, including Enron, of course. Uh, every one of those entities had some financial problem or another. Uh, they have some characteristics that are in common. Uh, this one is unusual, and it's unusual in the sense that literally, you know, there's no record keeping whatsoever. It's the absence of record keeping. Employees would communicate, you know, invoicing and expenses on, on Slack, which is, you know, essentially a, a you know, a, a way of communicating right. for chat rooms. Uh, they use QuickBooks, a multi-billion dollar company using QuickBooks. QuickBooks? QuickBooks. Uh, nothing against QuickBooks, it's a very nice tool, just not for a multi-billion dollar company. Uh, there's no independent board, right? We, we had one person really controlling this. Uh, no independent board. That's highly unusual in a size company this is. And it's made all more complex because we're not dealing with you know, widgets or, you know, or something that's tangible. We're dealing with, with, with crypto. And, and the techn technological issues are made worse when you're dealing with an asset uh, such as crypto. Mr. Ray, Mr. Bankman Freed has apologized. Uh, I'll, I'll uh... I'll subquote here for mistakes he has made. Based on your review, is there a way to know if the transfer of FTX customer funds to Alameda Research was done by mistake? I, I don't find any such statements to be credible. Reports suggest that FTX.com transferred more than half of its customer funds roughly $10 billion to Alameda Research. Is that accurate, sir? Uh, our work is not done. We don't have exact numbers for you today, but I will say it's, it's several billion dollars uh, uh, in that range. So we know that the, the size of the harm was significant. Mr. Ray, FTX.com held itself out uh, as having a sophisticated risk management system. Uh, commensurate with the size of its operations. You've touched on this a little bit. Based on your work to date, is this accurate? And can you explain the, uh, quote, sophistication of its risk management system? Uh, I can say that's absolutely false. Uh, there was no sophistication whatsoever. There was an absence of, of any management. Mr. Ray, Mr. Bankman Freed has been able to uh, confuse interviewers uh, by talking in circles around um, the multiple business activities of FTX.com. Mr. Ray, would you break down for us the different business, quote, activities of FTX.com? Uh, you know, <laughs> much of this I've described. Uh, essentially, they had two exchanges allowed users to trade crypto. Uh, and then there was the hedge fund. It's as simple as that. Uh, the users uh, you know, were allowed to make a variety of investments. They had a, a more expansive uh, ability to trade crypto uh, if you were a non-US citizen on the dot-com exchange. But I know it's been described publicly as very complex, uh, and it is to some extent. Uh, but essentially, you had two exchanges uh, and you had a hedge fund. Inside uh, both the U.S. silo, as I've mentioned, and inside the silos for uh, .com, there were regulated entities. We have regulated entities that are, for example, in Japan that are solvent. We had regulated entity Ledger X that was solvent. Those are sort of distinct from the other basic operations that we had, which was the two exchanges. Um, I thank you. 
Mr. Ray, and Madam Chairwoman, I'd like to submit an op-ed for the record describing an existing SEC rule that could have prevented customer assets from being misused. And I appreciate my constituent, Ron Krzyzewski, president of CEO of Stifel Nicholas, for his thoughtful comments. I associate myself with those, and I'd like this entered for the record. I thank you, and I yield back. Thank you very much. The gentleman from California, Mr. Sherman, who is also the chair of the Subcommittee on Investor Protection, Entrepreneurship, and Capital Markets, is now recognized for five minutes. For five years, I've been trying to ban American investments in crypto. I'm the only member of the House to get an F from the only crypto-promoting organization that rates members of Congress. My fear is that we'll view Sam Bankman-Fried as just one big snake in a crypto garden of Eden. The fact is, crypto is a garden of snakes. Now, from the outside, crypto just looks like a non-fungible token, an electronic pet rock for the 21st century, something that might be good to invest in, even though it has no apparent value, because you might get somebody else to buy it from you for even more. But in reality, the hope of crypto is to be a currency, to compete with the US dollar, and to announce its advantage over the US dollar in that competition. It puts the advantage right in the name. Crypto, hidden currency. Well, what, is there a big market for that? Is there a big advantage that crypto has over the US dollar if it actually became a currency, which it's not yet? Well, there are drug dealers, human traffickers, sanctions evaders who will find that to be a good feature. And as Sam Bankman-Fried would tell you, there's a hell of a market for bankruptcy court evasion. But the big market is tax evasion. And I know there are some on the other side who cheer every time a billionaire uh, escapes taxes. Um, the, other purpose, the other announced purpose of crypto is to compete with the US dollar as a world reserve currency, thereby enriching the corporate uh, billionaire bros and taking thousands of dollars of advantage away from every American family, because uh, we benefit from being a reserve currency. Now, Sam Bankman-Fried, uh, or should I say inmate 14372, um, had one purpose in all of his efforts here in Congress. It was a well-known figure, uh, only one wearing shorts. His one purpose was to keep the SEC out of crypto, to provide a patina of regulation, baby regulation from the CFTC. And I'll have one comment from my colleagues. Don't trash Sam Bankman-Fried and then pass his bill. I fear that could happen because Sam uh, was not the only crypto bro with PACs and lobbyists, and there is no PAC or lobbyist here to work for efficient tax enforcement or uh, sanctions enforcement. Now, I've heard from... Uh, some on the other side criticizing the SEC. In July, in this room, I criticized the uh, head of uh, the SEC for not going, at, the head of enforcement of the SEC, for not going after uh, crypto exchanges. But the fact is that, uh, without objection, I'd like to put in the record a letter signed by 19 Republican meter, members designed to push back on the SEC, a brushback pitch, if you're familiar with baseball, uh, Without objection, such is the order. Thank you. Um, attacking the SEC for paying attention to, and I'll quote, the purported risks of digital assets. And I'd like to put on the record, without objection, comments from eight members uh, uh, made in this room that were designed to attack the SEC as being a Luddite and anti-innovation um, anti for their efforts. Um, Mr. Ray, um, you're going to be looking at FTX. We know that Sam Bankman-Fried is already uh, in, uh, faces criminal charges, but he did have help. Will uh, you be looking for and turning over to U.S. Uh, law enforcement authorities uh, information about the possible criminal actions by Ryan uh, Salome, uh, Carolyn Olson, and the uh, 
the other folks uh, in the uh, in the fancy apartment. Uh, we are doing a thorough investigation, and uh, we will, of course, we have been cooperating with uh, the U.S. regulators and law enforcement agencies. So we will cooperate to turn over any information that would be relevant to them. Thank you. And I'll point out in particular that uh, one of the counts, count eight in the uh, complaint or indictment, uh, is violation of campaign finance laws. And I hope that what you will turn over is a list of the major uh, bonuses and or loans. It's reported that Ryan Salome got a $55 million loan so that uh, law enforcement can piece together when those loans and bonuses were made and whether they immediately preceded uh, illegal campaign, uh, disguised campaign contributions. Uh, can we count on you to do that? Yes, I can confirm that. My time has expired. Thank you. The gentleman from Oklahoma, Mr. Lucas, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chairman, and thank you, Mr. Ray, for appearing before the committee this morning, particularly in light of the recent arrest of uh, Bankman Freed. I expected you to be very cautious this morning in your answers, and in fact, I suspect you have been, but you've been very thorough and methodical, and the committee and I appreciate that indeed. indeed. First, I'd like to discuss the bankruptcy process, Mr. Ray. It's our understanding that some of the FTX entities were not included in bankruptcy, including Ledger X. Could you explain why those entities were not included and why, what might ultimately happen with them? Uh, Ledger X is a, is a perfect example of the entities that were kept out of bankruptcy. It's a regulated entity. Uh, it's fully solvent. The customer funds were segregated. Um, we, we believe that there's been no harm there whatsoever. There's no reason to put it into bankruptcy. Uh, ultimately, uh, we, you know, we will look to uh, sell uh, Le Ledger X uh, and put it in the hands of a good steward. And would you expand on how U.S. bankruptcy proceedings interact with international proceedings, for instance, like those in Australia? Yes, it's, it, the system is really designed to have a cooperative relationship with uh, uh, liquidators in other jurisdictions. We, we share information. Uh, we cooperate with each other relative to maximizing cus customer value and, and ultimately facilitating distributions uh, and you know, uh, you know, overall uh, facilitation of uh, uh, the completion of uh, uh, the scheme in, in order to uh, uh, render customers as whole as possible. As we've all seen, of course, SEC is charged, Mr. Bankman Freed with defaulting investors along with charges from the CFTC and the Southern District of New York. In your testimony, you described FTX Group as having an acceptable management practices, and you made that graphically clear, in particular to how Mr. Bankman Freed uh, is accused of. The SEC specifically alleges that one way in which Mr. Bankman Freed diverted FTX funds to Alameda Research was by directing customers to deposit cash into Alameda controlled bank accounts. Mr. Ray, could you explain how FTX was able to conceal that? Uh, you know, we're still, you know, somewhat early in our investigation, but we can confirm that uh, funds were uh, deposited directly uh, into Alameda as opposed to uh, FTX uh, bank accounts. Uh, unfortunate, obviously, a situation. One last question on uh, the bankruptcy. It's been reported that FTX Digital and FTX Australia were not included in the bankruptcy filing because local regulators had already initiated their own proceedings. Is it true uh, that they could not have been included because of that? Yes, our filing occurred on uh, November 11, and uh, there was other filings that had occurred shortly before. One last thought, Mr. Ray. Clearly, your profession is cleaning up messes that other people have made. That's a fair way to describe it not messes that you made, but they made. How does this compare, in your experience, uh, magnitude-wise? Well, it, it's several. The worst or the worst by magnitudes? Uh, it, it, it's one of the worst from a documentation standpoint. Uh, you know, even in the most uh, failed companies, you have a fair roadmap of what happened. Uh, we're dealing with literally a sort of a, a paperless bankruptcy in terms of how they created this company. It makes it very difficult to, uh, uh, to trace and track uh, assets, uh, and particularly, as I've said, in the crypto world. Uh, it's, it's really unprecedented in terms of uh, the lack of documentation. 
Bankman Freed uh, clearly tried to exhibit himself uh, as the brightest of the bright. But being bright neither makes you honest nor a fool, does it? Thank you, Mr. Ray. Thank you. The gentleman from Texas, Mr. Green, who is also the chair of the Subcommittee on Oversight and Investigations, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I thank the witness for appearing today. Uh, sir, I have in uh, my left hand in a sealed indictment from a grand jury as it relates to Mr. Samuel Beckman Freed, and in my right hand, the Securities and Exchange Commission's complaint that has been filed against the same defendant. Let's put aside the civil complaint. I have one question, but first I'd like to lay a predicate by going through these charges in the criminal complaint. Wire fraud on customers, conspiracy to commit wire fraud on lenders, conspiracy to commit commodities fraud, conspiracy to commit securities fraud, conspiracy to commit money laundering, and the list goes on with a few others. I mention these things to you, sir, because Dr. King reminded us that nothing in all the world is more dangerous than sincere ignorance and conscientious stupidity. Uh, Mr. Bankman Freed has pretty much indicated that he just made a big mistake, that uh, he was doing the best that he could to be a servant and of great service to humankind. But I would also mention this, he did attend Canada USA math camp, a summer program for mathematically talented high school students. He also has a uh, degree from MIT, 2014, bachelor's degree in physics with a mind in mathematics. Is all of this just one big mistake that was made by this this gentleman, uh, sir, as you see it, based upon what you've seen so far, it looks to me like there may be some malfeasance here. You know, we're certainly, uh, you know, investigating everything that happened relative to uh, these circumstances. Uh, you know, we're, at this stage, you know, we're trying not to, you know, lay judgment or put labels uh, on actions. Uh, we're focused on, you know, accumulating and maximizing the assets. Uh, for the victims, that's our number one priority. Uh, in doing so, we will also uh, investigate potential causes of actions to maximize value. Uh, and that does require us to get into the underlying uh, facts and motivations and what happened. Uh, so we fully expect to explore that. Thank you. Would you consider this to be sincere ignorance? Uh, you know, again, I, I don't want to put labels on it. Um, obviously, there's been failure here of a, a massive uh, proportion. Uh, ultimately, uh, you know, I think others will, will judge him uh, uh, by his actions. Mm -hmm. I, um, I find it difficult to, to believe that we're dealing with conscientious stupidity. Uh, it, it seems to me that you'd have to be rather talented to do all of these things to the extent that they were done and um, do them successfully for as long as he was able to accomplish these things, that they just don't emanate from ignorance and stupidity. Uh, and a lot of people have been hurt. And aside from the civil actions, I, I think that we've, we have to send a message to the others who would take advantage of people uh, that this is not going to be tolerated. And I thank you for what you've done. You've been very direct. I read your testimony. And based upon your testimony, it just seems to me that we have more than sincere ignorance and conscientious stupidity. 
I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, the gentleman from Texas. Mr. Sessions. Madam Chairman, thank you very much. Mr. Ray, thank you very much for being here. I think each of our members have been sincere in saying thank you for your professionalism and adding this to your career of other restructuring that you uh, have not only experience in, but bringing to bear. I've got several questions, and perhaps you can answer them, which would help me. At its best, the largest point of, of, of investor exposure by an American investor, what amount of money do you think that was that was held in FTX? Uh, I, I'm not in a position really to give you individual numbers at this point. Uh, you know, we do know with the U.S. Uh, there's hundreds of millions of dollars that were at stake. And of course on the dot-com, which is the international exchange, uh, that's in the billions of dollars. Uh, there's uh, one of the difficulties we have is that uh, uh, there's millions of accounts. Uh, some of those accounts you know, could be by multiple users. So we're in the process of really analyzing how those accounts roll up to individual customers. Are you, are you aware of the SEC at any point uh, asking questions, coming to visit, uh, providing paperwork uh, about these hundreds of millions or billions of dollars that the, it drew some attention from the SEC about this American investment or what I would say uh, exposure? Uh, I'm not, but you have to recognize that I, you know, parachuted in on, on November 11th, so I have no history with the company at all whatsoever. So you do not know about any uh, questions, interaction? Uh, have you heard about whether there was uh, an attempt <laughs> to avoid any of this? Was any of it ever discussed by any of the people that you have gained information from? Uh, I, I'm not privy to anything on a pre-petition basis. Thank you. Um, do you have an idea about the value of assets that was lent to FTX, uh, by FTX or Alameda to Mr. Bankman-Fried, the amount of money that they loaned him? Uh, well, we know that the size of the loss, you know, measured essentially, you know, at this period of time is several billion dollars, but you have to remember that, you know, asset values, you know, fluctuate. So uh, how much the value assets are worth at the time that they may have been transferred to uh, FTX.com may be a different number uh, than the loss as of any particular date. Uh, we do, of course, know that we have several billion dollars of losses, and we know that uh, there was billions of dollars lent out, billions of dollars of other investments, so that we essentially have a roadmap to figure that out. The roadmap that you're speaking about in your past, I don't claim you necessarily know it now, were IRS forms that were filled out by the company, were they properly filled out? Have you looked at those to see that they were complying with the IRS law? Uh, we are looking into that very thing. We've hired uh, Ernst & Young. Uh, they are taking a comprehensive review. They're going backwards and starting with the earlier years. Uh, we're reviewing the return that was filed in 20, uh, 20, uh, 2020, uh, 2021. And of course, they're looking at all the transactions within 2022. So that review is ongoing and we certainly will uh, look at that in detail. As an expert, I would consider you an expert in this arena, would you think that it would be important that the SEC, and I don't know the law, but would have access to, as part of their any due diligence they were doing to look at that IRS filing to, to determine perhaps some, whether someone was or was not following the law? Would that be part of a due diligence? Well, we certainly would make you know, anything like that available to any of the regulatory agencies whether it's the SEC or the IRS, you know, we'll fully cooperative to them. Anything that would aid in their investigation, it would be available to them. Do you think it would be pertinent for this committee to be able to receive that IRS information going back so that we would make a determination about whether 
proper utilization of oversight was being done? Uh, we certainly, you know, we want to be cooperative with the committee as well, and uh, we can certainly work with staff to, uh, to address what you might need. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chairman. Chairwoman. Thank you. The gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Cleaver, who is also the chair of the Subcommittee on Housing, Community Development, and Insurance, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Mr. Ray, thank you so kindly for, for being here today. Um, have you read the uh, full testimony that was planned uh, by um, our missing guest? I, I have not read his full testimony. Uh, I've, 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 some pieces of it have been relayed to me, but I have not read it. Uh, I've not read one word of it, actually. Yeah, I, I don't know him personally and, and probably don't want to, but um, his testimony is so disrespectful. I mean, there's not a person up here who would like to show this to their children in, in line two of, of this um, of this message. Um, he says, and I quote, I would like to start out by formally stating under oath. Um, you can't say it. And I, yeah, I can't even say it publicly. The next two words, absolutely insulting. This is the Congress of the United States. And um, I'd like to submit this, Madam Chair, uh, for uh, the record. Without objection, if you're inserting that into the record. Without objection, such is the order. Um, I, I want to follow up on, on what Mr. Sessions, on the discussion Mr. Sessions uh, was having with you um, uh, on this, uh, the issue. Uh, and if um, you are required, I mean, we have, you have one, one requirement that, that you are um, supposed to submit to each customer and the IRS, uh, the Form 109B, right? Yes. What else are you required to do? I, I'd have to defer to the, you know, the tax folks. Uh, they're experts in that field, and uh, uh, I'm sure they'll, uh, they'll do a thorough review of what should have been submitted. No, I'm, 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 what do you know now that you, you are supposed to submit other than the 109B uh, to Every customer enter to the Internal Revenue Service. And you know, I don't, I don't know personally at this point. Uh, you know what was required to be submitted. You know that's part of our review with, uh, with our uh, independent accountants. Well, could you expand uh, or, or um, maybe even update us uh, on the extent of the poor controls in the areas previously identified in your November seventeenth? Declaration. It's a, you know it's an extensive list. It, it really crosses the entire uh, spectrum of the company, uh, from lack of lists of bank accounts, uh, hundreds of bank accounts uh, dispersed all over the world, uh, lack of a you know a, just a complete list of employees and their functions by by group or name, uh, extensive use of you know independent contractors. Uh, as opposed to employees, uh, lack of insurance uh, that you normally would see in certain uh, uh, businesses, uh, either inadequate insurance or complete gaps in insurance. Uh, for example, the Alameda silo had no insurance whatsoever. Uh, so those are, I mean, there's, the list goes on and on. Um, you, you know, we could spend all day on that. Uh, yeah, we have time. Uh um, I wonder if you would support a resolution that I've been thinking about introducing, um, changing the name of cryptocurrency to creepy dough currency. Um, I'm, I'm going to discuss this with my colleagues. I think it's, it's an appropriate name. I just wanted to know whether you would support changing it to creepy dough. Uh, I'll, I'll leave that skill set to, to, to the, the committee. All right, thank you. I yield back. Thank you. The gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Luke Meyer, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. 
Mr. Ray, it's been reported that FTX couldn't get a bank account for some time. As a result, FTX used uh, Alameda Research's bank's, bank accounts. Um, does this raise any red flags for you, the fact they couldn't find a way to get a bank account? Well, uh, there's a few red flags. Obviously, the, you know, the banking bank situation should have been a real red flag uh, for someone being asked to deposit money into a, an account that was not the exchange account. Uh, certainly should have been a red flag for, for customers. Is Alameda a U.S. chartered bank or is it offshore? It, it, or the bank that they're using, I should say. It, it's really not a bank per se. It's just a, uh, most of the entities in, in, the, in the structure uh, are, I mean, they're just unregulated entities. So it's just, uh, it's, just, it's just an entity that passes through money. It's the hedge fund that does things. It doesn't have a bank account per se? Oh, it has bank accounts, absolutely. Uh, in the U.S.? Uh, yes. Okay, so here we have a company that's offshore. It can't get a bank account offshore. It has to come into the U.S. to be able to do its banking business. In other words, and the important part of this, this comment is that in order for these companies to exist, they've got to be able to change their digital assets into hard U.S. dollars at some point. So they need a bank account. And so they needed Alameda to be able to do that. Is that, is that roughly correct? Uh, you know, any of the silos had in, in bank accounts so that that certainly you know is uh, exist. The bank separate bank accounts do exist. Uh, I think the real issue here for us is that money was transferred from one account to, to, to the other, uh, you know, seemingly without limit. That that is the issue. Okay, you you talked about the accounting issues. Um, you know, it, it's interesting from the standpoint that. We're, we're, we're talking today about a problem with these cryptocurrency firms, with securities firms, uh, and we can't have an accounting system that actually works. You know, this should be a really big red flag for all of us who are in the financial services world with regards to the Chinese investments that we're making, and we're not able to get accounting information on those firms. What else is going on with those firms, similar to what the debacle is that we have here with FTX? That's just a sideline comment. Um, one of the questions I've got is with regards to the Farmington State Bank. This is a, uh, an investment that uh, Alameda made into, and it's a little bitty bank according to a New York Times article. State of Washington, 26th smallest bank out of 4,800 in the country. They bought it in 2020, had a net worth of 5.7 million, and they dropped 11.5 million in for a percentage of the ownership. Do you know off the top of your head what the percentage of ownership was in that bank that they purchased? Uh, I believe that ownership was approximately 10%, but I can... I can okay, that's that. what I've heard, too. So, therefore, they paid 20 times book, which is yeah. off the charts outrageous. Um, so, it should be a red flag over the place. Yet, they were able to purchase that, even though it's a minority interest, but 20 times book. FDIC allowed that to happen. They changed names to uh, Moonstone Bank. And since then, they've... Uh, uh, four separate accounts have dropped to roughly 71 million. Again, according to FDIC data and according to this article... Um, have you looked at this relationship at all yet to see what's, what's going on here and, and what, whether there's any real, uh, uh, irregularities at all? We, we are looking at it. Uh, it certainly uh, is one of the <clears throat> things that came to our attention fairly quickly. Uh, we're looking at uh, uh, what the dollars were that went from the FTX group to that bank, uh, and we're looking at the connections uh, of that bank uh, to, uh, uh, to uh, the Bahamas. <laughs> Is it the way this all transacted here, is this, is this common, by the way, that they purchase businesses and, and dump excessive amounts of money based on the fact they had it, whether it was a good investment or not, and all these different companies? I mean, this looks like a really excessive investment to actually go out and buy a bank to be able to do something with it, uh, stuff it full of money. Uh, so, I don't know, is there money laundering going on here? Is there some missing dollars? Is somebody stuffing away something in their back pocket to be able to some, at some point down the road take off with it? Is, is that what's going on here? I mean, it, it begs a lot of questions here when you see this kind of activity. Well, there's a lot more questions than their answers. Uh, you know, certainly, it's highly irregular, and that's what's gotten our attention. Well, I thank you for your uh, comments this morning, and it's, it's concerning when you see this sort of lack of accounting, and you see somebody dealing in this sort of level of money, and there's no and there's lots of different companies where money shifts back and forth, and you wonder by living offshore in the Bahamas if there's not some faraway bank account that's being stuffed with money we'll never ever find. I hope you do your job and do it well, Mr. Ray. Thank you for being here this morning.
Thank you. The gentleman from Colorado, Mr. Perlmutter, who is also the chair of the Subcommittee on Consumer Protection and Financial Institutions. You're now recognized for five minutes. Uh, thanks, Madam Chair. Mr. Ray, I have so many questions, it's hard to even figure out what questions to ask. So let's just start with some easy ones. How long have you been on this job? Four weeks. Four weeks. Um, do you know when the Madoff bankruptcy was filed? Uh, probably circa 2008, I guess. I, I don't so know say 2008. And do you know they just made a distribution out of that bankruptcy last week? That's what I understand, yes. So that's, what, 14 years? How yes. old are you? <laughs> Is that a permitted question? Because <laughs> I want you to add 100 to whatever your age is when you finally untangle all of this. And the reason I say that is we watched this FTX, but a bunch of other crypto companies start thrashing about, say, 9, 10, 12 months ago. And, and the, the, as the house of cards started falling down, the thrashing became more. We, we had something like that in Colorado back in the 80s when the savings and loans were failing and everybody was sort of trading their, their funny money. Their, we called it trading cats for dogs to hide lousy loans, to, you know, to not show the, the failures of those particular banks. Here, you know, your job, I think, as the... As, uh, the bankruptcy trustee or conservator or whatever you are, is to go gather as many assets as you can, and that could be from some very innocent people who got paid money, to then spread it out equally among who you think the real creditors are, or, I mean, is that sort of a fair statement? Uh, it, it's a general statement, but it's not far off. Well, because we on this committee and, and a number of us had to deal with the Madoff stuff, you know, one of the things you're going to face is uh, some guy say, I'm more innocent than that guy. You know, I should get to keep my money even though I got paid yesterday, but I'm an innocent guy. You're going to be dealing with so many preferences, so many fraudulent transfers. I mean, have you any idea what the total money in and the total money out of FTX was? We don't have a full accounting at this early stage, no. Do you know how much was in tokens? So let's say I have Dogecoin, or I don't even know how you say it, but I have 10 Dogecoin, which a year ago, is it Dogecoin or Dogecoin? Doge, Dogecoin. All right, Doge, I have 10 Dogecoins, all right? A year ago, 10 Dogecoins, for sake of argument, was worth $1,000, so 100 bucks a coin. I put that in there. But Dogecoin today is worth, like, I don't know what, say, not nearly that much. I mean, how are you going to evaluate that as to what I should get out of the bankruptcy? Well, at first it starts with, doing an accounting and a tracing of, of, of all the assets, you know, it, it, both the ins and the outs. Uh, and that's made difficult, of course, by the commingling of assets. So uh, perhaps perhaps you, you may have invested in a certain uh, coin or an altcoin. Uh, we'll have to trace what happened to that coin because, again, what we've explained here today and through our, our testimony is there's commingling of assets, so that makes it you know, a, a bit more complicated than simply how much is, you know, my coin worth, right? So uh, we're going to, it's going to be a painstaking process of looking for the ins and outs, what happened to your crypto. Uh, of course, at the bankruptcy, at the time of the bankruptcy, we know what, you know, what, when that occurred. We have a very specific time when that bankruptcy occurred. And we will look at customer accounts as of that date. And that will be determined essentially what, what your account position was. But of course, you know, you know, assets, you know, vary in terms of uh, fluctuating in, in, in uh, value. And again, uh, because of the circumstances we find ourselves in, in the lack of documentation, uh, the, the potential commingling between silos, and then also uh, what happened with uh, Alameda taking funds from FTX.com, it isn't as simple as 
you know, how many coins did I have in my account? Well, I guess what I'm saying is if I put $1,000 in and it's gone, and I put 10 Doge coins in and they're gone, eventually you're going to have to figure that out. And I, my guess is you will be back here in a year when you have a better handle on the numbers to be talking to this committee. And thank you for doing this. I yield back. Thank you very much. Uh, you know by now that Mr. Perlmutter is a bankruptcy attorney. Uh, you can tell by those questions. So this would be a good time to enter into the record without objection. I would like to enter into the record the indictment of Sam Bankman Freed uh, by the Southern District of New York uh, that was unsealed this morning and the separate filings from the Securities and Exchange Commission and the Commodity Futures Trading Commission, both of which were filed this morning. Thank you. With that, the gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Heisinger, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair and Mr. Ray. Um, I'm going to get my colleague to shift a little bit or get up. Thank you. <laughs> um, uh, one, one quick question. Have, have you been sharing your findings uh, with the SEC at all as you've been going through this? Yes. Okay. Uh, how about the Southern District of New York? Yes. Okay. Um, I'm going to get to a couple of uh, practical questions because I think these were the things I was going to ask you and then also ask Mr. Uh, Bankman Freed. Um, in your declaration, you said that the, uh, quote, the FTX.com platform was not available to U.S. users, close quote. However, earlier this month, uh, CFTC Chairman Benham uh, suggested in testimony before the Senate Agriculture Committee that 2% of funds housed at FTX.com were from U.S. individuals. Can you confirm whether uh, there were U.S. individuals or in persons, in fact, customers of FTX.com? Uh, yes, there, we've, we found that there's a small number of, of U.S. Uh, customers that had engaged in uh, as customers at Is 2% small in your estimation, or is it uh, less or more? Y y I, we don't have those kind of numbers on, on an a, on a investor basis. We have it on a customer basis, uh, but you're okay. talking about l less than a couple hundred. But it could amount to billions. I mean, you said earlier it is billions of dollars that was in there, or at least it could be millions or hundreds of thousands. We, we don't know that number, or do you know that? Number? I, I don't know. I don't know that number. The, 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 you know, billions would sound very, very high. Okay. Right? Well, you had mentioned that there was billions yes. in it. Yes. it. Yeah, but clearly, I'm, I'm giving you the range. So. Yeah, you clearly, as U.S. customers, there we don't have an accounting of what those particular customers had in the dot okay. com exchange. W will determining this be part of your work through this bankruptcy process? Oh, oh absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Uh, will part of your work be determining which assets belong to which customers, more specifically U.S. customers of FTX.com? Yes, we will do a, really a tracing analysis that will try to identify you know, the, the most of the sources and the use of all the funds. So whether it's 10 customers that had a lot of money or 1,000 customers that had some money? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Um, can you provide some indication of whether customer funds from FTX.com were in fact transferred to Alameda Research? Well, it's definitely assets of, of customers in the dot-com silo were transferred to Alameda, no question about it. Uh, uh, we have not seen this at this stage uh, from the U.S. silo. But, of course, you know, we, we do have one concern, and that's the concern we're chasing down, which is whether or not there's commingling between that dot-com silo and the U.S. silo exchanges. And, and the reason for that is we know that there was sort of common control and access uh, of authorized users at, at this most senior management level amongst all of the assets. So it's something we have to, we have to focus on. We haven't seen evidence right now of that, uh, but certainly that's something that we need to investigate and trace. Okay, and my remaining two minutes, I want to turn a little bit to operations. Uh, is there any evidence of his parents' involvement in the operations? We're Maybe. investigating that uh, as well as any other you know, players. In the, Email, in the Slack. You know, it's, Signal. A, it's, a, it's, a, it's billions of records. It's a okay. very vibrant environment. Um, so I hear that you haven't discovered that. I mean, it would, it would seem interesting that, uh, that they didn't either give legal advice or business advice or parental advice, maybe. Well, well certainly, clearly. You know, I think in our first day papers, we indicated that... Uh, uh, that Mr. Bankman had given legal advice. Okay, Ed, had he been an employee of FTX, as has been reported? Uh, you know, I, I don't know if, his, if he actually had an employee status, uh, okay. but he certainly received payments from 
uh, the family did receive payments. Okay, that sounds like employment to me. You got a payment for, okay. Well, I, I, I raise that because on December 8 of 2021, uh, I met with Sam Bankman Freed in my office, which I will note was just immediately before he came down to the hearing. He was at least 15 minutes late and his father accompanied him uh, in that meeting. Uh, I asked him, focused on what types of regulation he was under, his engagement with regulators and how that affected FTX. Um, but uh, it, it seems to me that um, there's a lot more to uncover here. Uh, certainly, Mr. Bankman Freed uh, has, uh, has uh, let's say, wooed many in New York, Silicon Valley, around the world, and yes, certainly here in DC. Uh, he was, uh, it, they, they loved, I think everybody loved the exciting idea of a politically progressive, smart entrepreneur who was going to reimagine capitalism uh, and, uh, and change the, word, uh, the world, feeling better about themselves, all while making them gobs of money. And I'm glad to see it's finally unraveled. So my time is, uh, my time is up and I yield back. Thank you. The gentlewoman from Ohio, Mrs. Beatty, who is also the chair of the Subcommittee on Diversity and Inclusion is now recognized for five minutes. First of all, let me just say thank you to Chairwoman uh, Waters and our ranking member and certainly to you, Mr. Ray. Uh, we have heard a lot. Uh, a lot of this has been difficult to digest. Uh, primarily because of what has happened uh, to so many people and so much money uh, involved. Mr. Ray, you mentioned in your testimony that one of your primary goals is to limit, to the greatest extent possible, the harm suffered by FTX um, customers. Hundreds and hundreds of million dollars have been removed from crypto wallets and in its estimates that about one million people have money frozen in the exchange. Can you? And the likely funds back. And if you can't answer that question, I <laughs> have the information. Ms. Beatty, would you repeat the question? You were interrupted for a minute or so there. Oh, I, I am sorry. I am uh, at home recovering, so I hope, sorry about any connection. Basically, hundreds of dollars have been removed from crypto wallets, and it's estimated that about one million people have money frozen in their exchange. Can you tell us uh, how many users have lost money and when will they get their money back? Uh, well, our process is such that, you know, we are securing our assets every day. Uh, every day we are out looking for wallets and the keys to those wallets to maximize the recovery of value. So that's an ongoing process. We've secured all the cash in the bank accounts uh, to the extent that uh, we can at this point. We've secured crypto assets. We're still in the process of doing that. Uh, I mean, ultimately, that, that's, a, you know, that's a question of, of months. Uh, the litigation has been pointed out by other members. Uh, uh, certainly will take a longer time frame, uh, but that is our, you know, is our number one focus, uh, is, to, you know, is to generate value to repay those customers. I don't have a customer account for you today. Uh, we do know that there was 2.7 million users uh, in the U.S. silo. Uh, which, which again, is overstates the customer relationships because people had multiple trading accounts. Uh, and in the dot-com silo, uh, we had uh, over 7.6 million uh, users, again, uh, overstating the actual customer relationships due to the, the multitude of accounts by any particular customer. So we need to get to the bottom of, of those customer numbers. Thanks, Mr. Ray. Let, let me ask you this. Despite the fact that FTX told customers it would uh, not trade customers' funds, we know now that FTX loaned out, I, I think, about $10 billion in customer assets for proprietary trading. Mr. Ray, do you know um, how it was possible for FTX to access clients' funds in violation of its own terms of service uh, that noted Ray it without clients' per uh, permission? 
and expose his customers to such massive loss? Well, as, as I indicated, I mean, there was no corporate controls, no corporate oversight, no independent uh, board, and uh, uh, the owners of the business, the senior management had, you know, virtual control of, of the accounts of, of each of the silos and could move money or assets, you know, as they desired undetected uh, by customers. Uh, so, uh, you know, to the extent there were rules, and there were very few, obviously they were made to be broken. So I think what I'm hearing you saying is that w there was uh, no one personally uh, uh, approved this. Well, let me ask you a last question. Uh, can you tell us what regulatory changes could prevent the uh, unauthorization or the un unauthorizing customer funds in the future based on your wealth of experience? Uh, you know, without, you know, speculating about what regulatory fix could, there could be, uh, and I've said in my earlier testimony, uh, you know, the, the, the critical thing is segregation of customer funds and transparency. Okay, and lastly, in your five points that you outlined, uh, and I'm sorry if you said it before, is there a timetable that you think you can get to that? And that can be a yes or no. I think I'm getting close to my time. Uh, there, there's no particular time frame, uh, but it's it's as quickly as possible uh, in, in my experience uh, with Enron. And is, uh, is that months? Is that weeks? Quickly as possible. It's, it certainly isn't weeks. It's definitely months. Uh, and the causes of action, you know, could take longer. Uh, but we will marshal assets on a weekly basis and on a monthly basis, uh, and we'll do that as quickly as possible. Thank you so much for taking the time to try to help us out. Uh, I yield back. Thank you. The gentleman from Kentucky, Mr. Barr, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Mr. Ray, in your declaration, you said that many of the companies in the FTX group did not have uh, appropriate corporate governance and that this situation is unprecedented. Uh, you also, in your testimony today, said that the FTX collapse stems from the lack of an independent board and a complete failure of any internal controls or governance whatsoever. Can you elaborate uh, in describing the governance structures for FTX.com that led you to make those uh, comments? Well, for, first and foremost, you know, there's no independent board of directors. Uh, so one of the first things that, that I did was put on an independent board of directors uh, led by our chairperson, uh, who's the former U.S. attorney and uh, uh, Honorable uh, Joseph Farnan, uh, former U.S. district court judge. So put in a corporate structure of independent directors, uh, put in separate officers, uh, the new officers of the company. I put in a new CFO, uh, a new chief information officer, a new head of administration, all independent, uh, with, with some background and experience in these, in these sectors. None of the employees, I mean, there's a lot of titles in the company, but no experience to back it up. Can, can, uh, you, can you explain how um, the uh, FTX.com governance structure differs from the governance structures of FTX US? Virtually no difference, there was no structure. Um, Mr. Ray, in your work so far, have you examined the governance structure or the flow of assets to the FTX Foundation or its various affiliates, uh, including FTX Community, FTX Climate, or the Future Fund? We are digging into that. We, we've not completed our review. I am curious uh, in your work um, whether or not uh, you will determine whether those entities were established properly as nonprofits or whether or not the funds received were improperly transferred customer accounts. Do you have any visibility into that yet? Uh, we're, we're looking at that right now. We've asked our folks at Ernst & Young to look at the, the tax side of it, and we're investigating the, uh, the money transfers. Uh, so you can be sure we're going to dig into those details. Was the FTX Foundation and those other uh, not-for-profit, uh, ostensibly not-for-profit uh, entities, were they completely separate from any of the for-profit entities? Uh, they, they were owned by, by uh, uh, Sam Bankman fried um, I, you know, I can't tell you that they were separate because they got funds from uh, Alameda. So we, we know the source of their funding was from the FTX group. There was separate ownership, but not separate you know, funding. So commingled assets in that case as well? Absolutely. Okay. Um, at least one ESG ratings firm gave FTX a higher score for governor, governance than ExxonMobil. Given your testimony that FTX's collapse stems from the 
the absolute concentration of control in the hands of a very small group of grossly inexperienced and unsophisticated individuals who failed to implement virtually any of the systems or controls necessary for a company that is entrusted with other people's money or assets. What would you say about this ESG governance rating, which rated FTX higher than ExxonMobil? I'd get my money back. Um, can you identify which entities uh, had audited uh, financial statements? Uh, e yes, uh, I can. Uh, so there was no audit at, Al at Alameda, no audit at the Venture Silo. There was audit at the uh, uh, U.S. Silo uh, and uh, also audit at the, the uh, dot-com silo. I can't speak to the integrity or quality of those audits. Uh, we're reviewing, obviously, uh, the books and records. Uh, and as I've said earlier, uh, you know, much of those books and records were maintained on you know, fairly unsophisticated ledger, ledger uh, work, work, workbooks. And, and you testified of the lack of record keeping. Yes. And so um, there's a whole lot of uh, financial statements that are either not audited or not available. Is that fair to say? That's, that's fair to say. Um, in your declaration, you stated that you did not believe that those audited financial statements were reliable. Can you elaborate on why you believe that to be the case? Well, we've lost $8 billion, right, of customer money. So by definition, uh, I don't trust a single piece of paper in this organization. Uh, Sam bankman fried in his testimony to this committee uh, on December 8th of last year said that FTX has designed and offered a platform with a market structure that is risk-reducing. To be sure, there are irresponsible actors in the digital assets, asset industry, and those actors attract the headlines, but FTX is not one of them. Was that statement incorrect? False. Thank you. And let me conclude by uh, describing what is going on here by a, a, a popular crypto commentator. If you set up an exchange where you're the market maker, you're the issuer, you're the prime broker, and then you trade against your own customers, you have a vested interest in creating the assets, promoting the assets, and manipulating the price of the assets. What you have is a crypto casino. I yield back. Thank you. The gentleman from California, Mr. Vargas is now recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Chair. I'd like to begin by thanking you once again for taking the lead to hold bad actors accountable and pursue transparency in the cryptocurrency space. And also, Mr. Ray, I want to thank you for being here today to testify. Um, I, I think I start off a little bit like Paul Krugman does in the New York Times. I don't get the point. I really don't get the point of blockchain and cryptocurrency. It's like keeping track of how many times you chew gum, like who cares? Um, there's other ways that are, uh, I think, less fraudulent to, to make transactions. But anyway, that being said, um, how many times have we talked here about the potential for abuse of fraud in, in the crypto market? Quite a bit. We've had a lot of cheerleading from some people, especially on the other side of the aisle. I don't hear it today. I haven't heard it yet, but I do want to hear it, like we normally hear it, how wonderful it is and how they shouldn't be regulated by the SEC, that they're too tough on them. Imagine we're not going to hear that today, especially after what we saw with FTX. But we do want to see order and transparency in this industry and throughout the financial markets. If you are an issuer of cryptocurrency or a manager of cryptocurrency exchange, and you conduct business with U.S. customers, consider this FTX collapse as your public service announcement. Come into compliance with the Securities Act of 1933, the Securities Act of 1934, and all other applicable federal and state laws. Do not skirt the law, mishandle U.S. citizens' funds, and then claim innocence. For the cryptocurrency industry to continue, citizens need to be informed, regulators need to uphold the laws, and companies need to comply. Now that. That wasn't happening, was it, Mr. Ray, under this particular company? No, sir. Why wasn't it? You, you, again, you have control in a small group of, 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 of individuals uh, without any oversight whatsoever, uh, you know, from an independent board or experienced managers. Uh, it's just a recipe for, for problems. What government entity is responsible for this fiasco? Uh, that's not for me to say. No, it is for you to say. You're right there, and I'm asking you. If, I, you I, if you had to opine, that's why you're there in the hot seat. Who is it? Should the SEC have been more aggressive, even though we had a lot of our 
friends on the other side saying they shouldn't have been? Should the SEC have been more aggressive? You know, it, it, I'm, not, I'm not experienced, in, I'm not a regulatory lawyer, I'm not here to express views about who should, who should regulate it. Uh, and I've said, uh, and very clearly, that we need transparency. Uh, customers need to have segregated accounts. They need to have ownership, it's their money, it's assets. It's really no different than a bank. You'd expect the same level of a scrutiny of, your, of any funds that you have on deposit with someone else. That is a minimum. I agree with everything you've said, but at the same time, I have to say that the product that they give is a, is a hybrid product, is it not? Well, it's certainly, a, it's a currency, it's an alternative currency, yes. So then who should regulate it? I, I don't have an opinion on that. Uh, you don't? Mr. Carson, no. Okay, well that's the whole problem, I think. I, I don't get the point of um, cryptocurrency to begin with, um, other than you know, if you're a terrorist or someone that wants to hide money. And then I, I get the point. But other than that, I don't get the point myself. But if we are going to have it, um, we have to regulate it. Someone has to be in charge. We have to make sure that we don't continue to defraud the American people. And that's where the government comes in. Somebody's got to take charge of this. I think it's the SEC. I've always thought it was the SEC. They had a lot of pushback from my friends on the other side. I didn't hear them quite today pushing back as they normally do. I'd love to see that. Um, but again, someone has to regulate this if it's going to exist. Don't you agree? I, I certainly think there has to be you know, more controls in this sector. Who should regulate it? I defer to this committee. That, Madam Chair, I yield my time back. Thank you. Thank you. Now, the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Williams, is now recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Mr. Ray, for being here. Appreciate it. There's been many comparisons that have been made as, as people examine what happened to FTX. And from uh, Bernie Madoff to Enron, it looks like this will go down as one of the largest frauds in history. And Mr. Ray, you have a unique perspective on the fact that you have worked on the Enron bankruptcy. I'd be interested real quick of you talk a little bit real quick about uh, how it compares. You got cut off in the early time, and I'd like to hear a little bit about that. You know, Enron was a, you know, is a, is a really a, a, a different company. Uh, you know, it was a, the, the crimes that were committed there were uh, uh, highly uh, orchestrated uh, financial machinations uh, by highly sophisticated people uh, to keep, you know, transactions off balance sheets. Uh, you know, the, this is really old fashioned in, in embezzlement. This is just taking money from customers and using it for your own purpose. Not sophisticated at all. Uh, sophisticated perhaps in the way uh, they were able to sort of hide it from people, uh, uh, frankly, right in front of their eyes. But this isn't, this isn't uh, uh, you know, sophisticated whatsoever. This is just plain old embezzlement. Old school. Old school. There you go. Uh, it seems like, uh, uh, Freed has some interesting ideas on how he can stay relevant in the FTX world, and even after stealing customers' money and driving the company into bankruptcy. And I have read that he wants to be retained as an outside consultant and uh, been very critical of your own appointment, quite frankly, uh, into this position. So after his arrest last night, all of his wishes seem even more unlikely. So what role, if any, should he play in FTX moving forward? Just the role he's currently playing. Okay. Zero. Good. Uh, you stated that FTX was a platform allowing for users to trade digital assets. Yes. Uh, were users engaged in simple exchanges of assets or were users permitted to engage in leveraged complex transactions? Yes. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, can you repeat your question? Sure. Uh, you stated that FTX was a platform allowing for users to trade digital assets. Were users engaged in simple exchanges of assets or were users permitted to engage in leveraged complex transactions? Yes. Okay. You also stated that you have recovered over $1 billion in assets. Can you give a description of the nature and type of assets you have recovered to date? Uh, we've recovered uh, over a billion dollars of crypto assets. These are you know, coins of various nature, uh, and we've secured those. Uh, uh, but that's been our primary focus. We've certainly also secured you know, our cash in all of our bank accounts. The bank accounts were frozen. We've got control over those accounts with new authorized 
users, which you know, certainly includes myself. Uh, but our main goal is to secure the cash and secure the crypto assets, and that is an ongoing uh, venture. Okay. Uh, thank you for being here, and I yield my time back. Thank you very much. The gentleman from Guam, Mr. San Nicolas, is now recognized for five minutes. <clears throat> thank you, Madam Chair. Mr. Ray, thank you for being with us here today. There's a lot of people following this, trying to understand, trying to understand what happened uh, for a variety of reasons. Um, I, of course, your primary responsibility will be to, to make sure that um, the um, creditors are made whole as well as uh, depositors and everybody else who has a, uh, a stake uh, in, in varying degrees within the company. My, my first question is, have we been able, have you been able to pinpoint the specific cause for FTX's collapse? I know that there's all kinds of stories about um, loans to the owner and um, no internal controls, loans to Alameda, commingling, but is there, is there a, specific, uh, a specific trigger point or a specific cause that has uh, resulted in the FTX collapse? Uh, you know, I, I think I've described it. It's, it's really just the unlimited uh, ability of those in control positions uh, to borrow customer funds or take customer funds and then deploy them for their own use. Uh, that use involved uh, margin trading, which is inherently, you know, risky. Uh, and, uh, of course, they've spent enormous amounts of money beyond that. Uh, but it's really the misuse of, of funds, and it's as simple as that, you know, and, and, you know on a large-scale basis. So what is, what is the, um, the, the big-picture um, balance loss as a result of this bankruptcy? How much, how much has FTX lost as a result of this? We don't have exact numbers, but we know Ballpark. it's several billion dollars, you know, in excess of $7 billion. In excess of $7 billion. Yes. So in excess of $7 billion, we're saying that the... Um, the uh, Sam Bankman Fried and Company uh, basically took or misallocated seven billion dollars, and that's why the and that's why FTX has collapsed. Right. So so funds were taken from customers, funds were invested, trading losses incurred in Alameda, and then funds were deployed that will never be you know uh, valued at the same dollar amount. There was over five billion dollars of investments made. Uh, Certainly there's some value there, and we will try to get that value uh, and sell those assets. Uh, but oftentimes, even when he made those sorts of investments, whether it was th directly or through others in management, sometimes he would do that really without any pro forma or any valuation. Um, not really quite sure how uh, some of the purchase price numbers were uh, derived. So it you know gives you a sort of worry, obviously, that... Uh, uh, the purchases were overvalued, so there's a concern there as well. So, uh, so Alameda, Alameda lost seven billion dollars as a result of investment decisions and, and margin trading. There's there's a there's a multitude of reasons that that caused you know the the gap in assets between the customer balances and and what's there today, and what we hope to gain. Uh, it can't be pinpointed just on on you know, losses on trading activity. I, the reason I'm asking, and I'm, I'm just kind of narrowing it down because my time is expiring, but it's important for us to very clearly understand what caused this collapse. You know, when um, we had the 2008 financial crisis and Bear Stearns collapsed and Lehman Brothers collapsed, you know, we could have gone in there and we could have pointed to all these different reasons that could potentially have, have contributed to it, but the underlying reasons were there was a subprime crisis and a lack of liquidity in these respective uh, institutions. That allowed us to have a policy response, a regulatory response to prevent that kind of thing from occurring in the future. The FTX collapse right now is just FTX, but are these lack of controls and are these environments that resulted in the FTX collapse, are those still existing today and could the same thing happen in similar operations such as uh, Binance, for example? Could they also engage in the same activities under the current regulatory regime and if things go wrong, have the same outcome? Well, sort of, sort of, just three points I'd make. Uh, first of all, I mean, we are going to detail the sources and uses and what happened to all the funds. That will tell us exactly, you know, how the losses were incurred. Some of those may be lessons learned. Some of them just, you know, frankly, will just be payments that were made, 
know, from other people's money. It's, it's, uh, it, it's no, that just, inherent. Just going back to my question though, Mr. Yeah. Ray, yeah. the circumstances that led to FTX's collapse, those circumstances still exist in the crypto space and can other companies collapse in a similar set of circumstances? Well, certainly we've seized trading, so it won't happen at our company. Could it happen at other companies? I can't speak to them because I don't know how each of these companies are operated. Uh, obviously, our company operated in a very distinct way that, that led to losses, but I think every company is different. My time's expired. Gentleman from Arkansas, Mr. Hill, is now recognized for five minutes. I thank the chairman. I appreciate you being here, Mr. Ray. Uh, glad to have you before the committee, and I want to thank uh, the ranking member, Mr. McHenry, and the chair, Chair Waters, for working constructively in the digital asset space uh, over the past uh, four years. And I, I want to remind my colleagues that uh, Mr. McHenry talked about uh, uh, bond ripoffs uh, in the railroad expansion in the 1870s and 1880s. True. Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac leading us down the Primrose, Primrose Path uh, in the early 2000s on housing ownership in the secondary market. And there were frauds and fraudulent actors. But that didn't mean that we didn't want to invest in railroads in the United States for the history of the country. And it didn't mean that we don't need a vigorous uh, single family housing market and secondary market in our country. So let's not confuse the malfeasance and disgusting activity of FTX with the fact that we need a proper, thoughtful regulatory oversight of digital assets. And so I thank Chair Waters and Ranking Member McHenry. Fourteen years ago this week, Bernie Madoff was arrested and charged with operating the largest Ponzi scheme in American history. Its collapse injured 37,000 investors and laid, led to major reforms at the Securities and Exchange Commission and their oversight, and FINRA. Bankman Fried was arrested in the Bahamas last night. In many ways, the fall of FTX dwarfs that of Bernie Madoff, with court filings suggesting that over one million creditors or somewhere in the lurch in the FTX silos. Americans were hurt, and I want everyone listening to know in today's hearing that this is just the first step that Congress is taking in understanding what happened and how to create the appropriate regulatory environment. We do want to understand the invented decisions that led to the collapse and the impact on our customers and other market participants and how to prevent it from happening again. Mr. Ray, thanks for stepping up in your leadership capacity. And in looking at the bankruptcy filing, uh, Prager Metis was the audit firm for the dot-com silo. Their website says they're the first ever CPA firm in the metaverse. So looking at their website, they have uh, 24 offices, 600 staff, 100 partners, principally California, New York, and New Jersey. You stated you're not familiar with Prager Metis, is that correct? That's correct. Are they cooperating uh, with your, uh, in your role as uh, bankruptcy trustee? Uh, we're reaching out to, you know, both uh, firms, audit firms, as well as the firm that does our taxes, and uh, uh, we certainly have tools available so if they don't cooperate, but everyone seems to be cooperating at this point. And are they, uh, you anticipate they'll actively participate in the forensic accounting work you're doing with Ernst & Young? Absolutely not, no. We, we, we uh, we are taking information that we get from uh, the prior uh, auditors and accountants and tax professionals, and then we're, we're going to take our investigation from there on an independent basis. Can you tell us who the partner in charge is of the audit at that firm? Uh, I can't tell you. I, 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 I can't tell you off the top of my head. Is it Jerry Eatle, Brian Goldblatt? Michael Williams, those names ring a bell? No, it's not. I can, I can, get, the sta I can get your staff. Would you there. provide that to us, please? Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. And then the uh, second auditing firm, are, are a Menino. You say you are familiar with them, and that's part of a London-based firm, is that yes, right? Yes, that's correct. And uh, so do you feel the same way about their performance based on the books and records you've seen, that they also were inadequate in serving as an auditing <laughs> firm? You know, I, I don't want to. You know, I wanna, certainly don't want to disparage that firm. Uh, we do have to look through uh, the books and records and look at the audits themselves and see how comprehensive they were, to see if the audit would have picked up uh, anything that we see. And uh, certainly, uh, we're going to look at the related party disclosures that are in those audits, uh, whether there's any footnotes or exceptions. Uh, we need to go. You know, we need to go back and, and look at all those audits just from a look back perspective to determine uh, what maybe maybe could have been done that wasn't done. 
Do you anticipate the United States being a creditor in these uh, proceedings, either for tax purposes? Uh? I, I, it's premature to tell. I mean, we're certainly looking at that ourselves, and to the extent that we find any irregularities uh, in the tax area, um, we'll certainly be notifying the IRS, but uh, nothing we've seen at this point. But again, our investigation is so early. You state that the internal controls were the weakest that you've seen sort of in your experience, but FTX US and FTX.com, essentially there is no distinction between those. And so whether you were an international investor or a domestic investor, it's all the same pot. Is that fair to say? I mean, that, that is certainly our worry. I mean, the, 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 there's a limited amount of US customers in the dot-com exchange, uh, but we are focused on you know commingling and we're worried that, uh, that the silos weren't respected from a for purposes of the crypto assets. The gentleman's time has expired. The gentleman from Connecticut, Mr. Himes, who is also the chair of the Subcommittee on National Security, International Development, and Monetary Policy, is now recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Mr. Ray, for being here and for uh, undertaking this remarkably complicated task. You know, at the end of the day, our job here is to learn from the mistakes that were made, who made them, and, and, and what we can do going forward. Uh, like it or not, we're moving into a crypto assets, crypto world, um, and uh, we really do need to learn. Um, this whole thing has the feeling of a Hollywood blockbuster. That's why the cameras are here, right? We've got a 30-year-old gazillionaire who raised billions of dollars, living in some condo with a bunch of young people, exotic products, tokens, and crypto assets. Um, it feels to me, though, as I look through particularly the SDNY indictment unsealed this morning, that a lot of what we're seeing here is as old as the hills. It's wire fraud. It's misleading investors. It's commingling of funds. This is as old as the hills. Um, there is something that, that, that I really do want to ask you about, though, which is a little different here. All the good work you've done with other companies, you were dealing with, by and large, money in banks or in other financial institutions. Here we've got tokens, which evidently were things of, quote, value, valued in some way or another, that were used as collateral, living in places called wallets, not in banks. So my question for you, that feels to me like what's exotic and different about this. How much more challenging is your job going to be because you're now operating in a world of tokens and wallets as opposed to dollars and banks? And what might, I know you're hesitant to get into regulatory questions, but what should we be thinking about, if nothing else, to help, for more, to help with more smooth unwindings of the inevitable bankruptcies that will occur in this, uh, in this industry moving forward? Uh, the, the, the principal issue that, that the company is facing in the crypto area, I and mean, it, is, it is from a technology perspective, it is different from the other bankruptcies because it is a, you know, it's not a not a plane, not a boat. It's it's uh, it's it's you know it's, it's crypto asset, and, and it has inherently so, so you know some difficulties. Uh, uh, you know, the assets can be you know uh, taken or, or lost. Um, we, we have. Uh, Assets that are in what are called hot wallets, and those are in cold wallets. Uh, hot wallets are very vulnerable to uh, to hacking. Uh, if you've done any you know any looking on the internet, you'll find that that hacking uh, is almost ordinary course in this business uh, sector. Uh, there are very lots of vulnerability to uh, the wallets. Uh, so that's this company, unfortunately. Uh, had a very, very challenging uh, record here. Um, you know, for some, you know, uh, transfers, there was no pathway for it. Uh, there's, there's, uh, our, our keys aren't stored in a centralized location. Uh, we don't know where all of our wallets are. Um, uh, passwords were sometimes uh, kept in, in just plain text format. So, this company was sort of uniquely positioned to fail. Uh, the lack of discipline on control of the wallets, uh, their storage, uh, the, the storage of passwords, uh, allowing multiple users to set up accounts, uh, almost created an environment where there was not a complete inventory of wallets. Uh, you can learn some lessons from that. I mean, you need to more, have more controls, more discipline, or centralized accounting functions, 
uh, more oversight and management. Uh, that's not to say that people, things won't happen. The hacking will, might occur. Yeah, yeah, uh, thanks, Mr. I have one, one more question, but I really appreciate that. We gotta follow up on that, because that's something for us to do. Um, the other thing that I can't stop thinking about here is, again, 30-year-old gazillionaire, I get it, all sorts of attractive things. Some of the supposedly smartest money on the planet, venture capitalists who are paid tens of millions of dollars to invest money, and, and I, maybe I wouldn't care if it was just the money of the very wealthy, but they're investing pension money. You know, they're investing university endowments. Uh, companies like Lightspeed, Sequoia, Greylock, the best of the best invested in this. And you told us, uh, you made a statement that, there, that this was the worst governance, the worst you had ever seen. Did you see any evidence of any appreciable due diligence on the part of these entities that gave Sam Brinkman freed uh, uh, hundreds of millions of dollars? Yeah, yeah I'm not aware of what you know, the, you know, these parties may have, have done in terms of their due diligence. Um, you know, it is surprising, obviously, in light of all the circumstances. Uh, but I, I, you know, I, I don't know what they did internally to verify these, uh, these investments. So well, obviously, uh, only they know that. Thank you, thanks very much, yield back. Gentleman from Minnesota, Mr. Emmer, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you, Mr. Ray, uh, like everyone else. We're appreciative of you being here today and testifying. I'm going to uh, start, for my part, with a series of quick questions that hopefully will assist this committee's investigation, and then I want to move on to some additional points, time permitting. Mr. Ray, there were over 100 corporate entities within FTX Group. Some had boards of directors and others did not. Was there a group-level board of directors overseeing the entirety of FTX? No, there was not. Would you agree that it's a bad decision for a complex firm like FTX to not have a top-level board of directors? Yes. Do you have concerns about the concentration of power in a small group of inexperienced individuals with no oversight? Yes. Did FTX.com have basic corporate functions like an accounting or human uh, resource department? No. Was there a legal department at FTX.com? Uh, yes, there was. Was there a compliance department? Uh, there were people with titles. Fair enough. Uh, and thank you, if, uh, to finally, to assist the committee's investigation. Would you agree that a financial firm the size of FTX needs accounting, human resources, legal, compliance, and risk departments to help prevent something like this from happening? Absolutely. In early April 2022, FTX and IEX announced a strategic partnership. Last week, the Financial Times reported on Alameda's venture capital portfolio, which listed FTX Trading's $270 million investment into IEX as a, quote, acquisition. Did FTX Trading acquire IEX? And if not, what type of investment did FTX Trading make into IEX? Uh, I, I'd have to get back to the committee on that specific investment. I'm not sure that was completed. Can you provide us with some information Absolutely. on it? Absolutely. I can get back to you on the staff on that. We know that uh, Chair Gensler had more meetings with FTX than anyone else in the crypto industry. We understand that what was being negotiated was a framework for digital asset exchange registration and token registration with the SEC that would benefit both parties. It would expand the SEC's jurisdiction in exchange for the SEC's preferential treatment of FTX over other industry participants. We understand there was a lot of activity to move this idea forward, including the circulation of draft short form disclosures that would enable filers to get tokens listed on this newly formed bespoke exchange. Mr. Ray, I know you're handicapped with the information you currently have obtained, but Chair Gensler refuses to answer our questions or testify before this committee Will you commit to sharing with this committee any internal documents you come across regarding communication between FTX and Mr. Gensler or others at the SEC? We're, we'll fully cooperate you know, with uh, the committee and the regulatory authorities with respect to our investigation. Again, specifically, I just want copies, of, this committee will want copies of those communications we to the extent they exist. Yeah, we can certainly work with your staff to get you what you need. Thank you. Uh, and Mr. Ray, I appreciate you mentioning uh, your concerns in the beginning of my questioning about the concentration of power in a small group of individuals with no oversight. That is the exact problem that open and permissionless technology like crypto and blockchain solve. It solves 
for the problems of centralization. You stated in your testimony that you've never seen such a, quote, utter failure of corporate controls at every level of an organization, from the lack of financial statements to a complete failure of any internal controls or governance whatsoever, close quote. FTX had disastrous or even non-existent systems for accounting, audit, cash management, cybersecurity, human resources, risk management, and other unacceptable management practices that currently make your job to uncover the facts quite difficult. Fortunately, the immutable characteristics of public blockchains that some people would care not to understand in this committee allowed the crypto community to reveal Sam Bankman Freed's fraud and the on-chain public record will assist law enforcement moving forward. I encourage my colleagues to understand Sam Bankman-Fried's con for what it is, a failure of centralization, a failure of business ethics, and a crime. It is not a failure of technology. I've worked across the aisle since I came to Congress, so the future of crypto reflects American values, the same way the internet does today. For the most engaged members of Congress on crypto policy, the FTX collapse remind us of why we care so deeply about this technology. Decentralization is the point. Thank you, and I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Kasten, who is also the vice chair of the Subcommittee on Investor Protection, Entrepreneurship, and Capital Markets, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and Mr. Ray, thank you so much for this. I'm, I'm struck by... I'm struck by a lot here, um, not least Mr. Perlmutter's comment that uh, this is going to take a long time to untangle. Maybe your comment to Mr. Lucas that this is a paperless bankruptcy saves you time because you run out of paper, but um, I appreciate your service. Um, a bunch of questions. One, I just want to clarify because it's all been implicit. All this bankruptcy is dollar denominated, correct? So as you go through to chase down values? Yes. Okay. yes. Um, I ask that because we've talked about commingling, we've talked about customer losses. There's been some public reporting. Um, suggesting that there may have been some inflation or misrepresentation of the value of FTT tokens. Is that, and I'm not asking you to opine on that right now, but to the extent there is some customer loss claim from that, is that also one of the categories of losses you're going after? Well, FTF, FTT, I'm sorry, was, was on that balance sheet of Alameda, and, and it certainly was served as effectively sort of collateral, uh, and it was largely controlled by uh, by Alameda, so it was a very illiquid token. It was uh, effectively a token created, you know, by the company itself with a limited float. So, in, in, inherent in the you know the, in, the, in the token itself was the illiquidity, uh, and certainly um, the size of the position the company had in its own token, you know, contributed to uh, uh, to this problem. But but if a customer were to buy that token at some value that because of its illiquidity could be manipulated, was the would the customer not effectively be sitting on, for lack of a better word, a forex risk? Well, there's certainly I mean all the crypto you know like any like any uh, asset you know has a certain volatility to it, and some are more volatile than others. And FTT was very volatile. Sure, and and I'm again I'm just to the extent that the volatility is natural, it's fine. To the extent it's manipulated, separate. Let me let me move on because we're close on time. There's been in a number of the public conversations that Sam Bankman-Fried has had, when asked about commingling, he often responds by talking about open margin positions. I want to just give you a chance to react to the difference between an open margin position and the commingling that you've observed. Yeah, I, I'm not sure exactly. Uh, you know, I tried to follow some of what his statements were, and it was very, very hard to really understand what he was really trying to say. I mean, we do know that they had you know, open mar margin positions at various times uh, in Alameda. And uh, Alameda was a customer, if you will, of the exchange. And it's through that customer relationship, plus other arrangements, that allowed Alameda to borrow those funds and then pick positions on the exchange like anyone you know, who would hedge uh, you know, a, a, an asset in, in the market. Uh, he had unusually large positions, of course. And sometimes they were wrong in those positions, and they resulted in big losses. Um, but ultimately, the commingling issue is just the same in a different issue. He took the money from FTX to cover those positions. And ultimately, when customers went to get their money back from dot-com, there was a run on the bank. Okay. Um, on November 12th, I guess just uh, the second day or the first day you were there, yes. there was a hacker who, who stole some $477 million worth of tokens from FTX. 
It was a November 29th interview um, with Mr. Bankman-Fried with Tiffany Fong when he said he's narrowed it down to like eight people, quote. Um, have you had any discussions with him? Do you have any sense of where, do you have any more visibility since November 12th um, on that hack? Have you had conversations with him about who those eight people might be? Is that, what's your, or in somebody's name? I, I, I have not had any conversations with him. Uh, we're, we're relying on uh, forensic and cybersecurity experts who are tracking uh, the, the crypto. You know, there's an open, you know, an open interface so you can see uh, you can ultimately find uh, where, you know, where the crypto ends up. We've had law enforcement involved, uh, so we're, we're tracking it. You know, I think we, we've got all the help we need in that front. Okay. Um, as I get close on the end of my time here, so far it seems like most of the losses have been within within these four silos, and I mean, 2.7 million customers, whatever that means, okay. is some exposure. Are you worried about any broader contagion? Are there broader contagion issues we should worry about as we, from our perspective here? I mean, certainly other bankruptcies of the scale have spilled into other sectors. Uh, you know, look, I, I, I think the industry, uh, you know, we've made a number of investments uh, in the crypto sector. If you look at that portfolio of $5 billion, uh, 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 one of our major investments, uh, uh, top 20 investments were in the crypto sector. Uh, so it's, it's a very trying time for the crypto sector. And uh, what I worry about is the impairment to that portfolio of $5 billion because obviously that's a recovery pool for our, for our customers. Thank you. Yield back. The gentleman from New York, Mr. Zeldin, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Mr. Ray, uh, I know you referenced earlier that you had not yet read uh, Sam Bankman-Fried's testimony that was prepared for today. I, I had a question that I wanted to ask. Uh, and I, I was going to read you something that he had included in his uh, remarks. In late 2021, I believe that Alameda Research likely had a net asset value of substantially over $50 billion market to market. I believe that Alameda was likely leveraged long, perhaps about 1.1 times leverage. That is, it had corresponding assets for roughly 90% of its position, borrowing the remaining 10%. That was roughly 1 20th of the maximum leverage FT allowed and roughly one third of the leverage assumed by the average FT margin trader. In early November 2022, over a three day period, the market value of assets that Alameda Research had held declined dramatically, I believe, by more than 50%. Uh, have you yet seen any evidence of a market value drop in Alameda's assets before November 2022? We, we haven't gone back to, to, to trace, you know, the, 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 the actual, I mean, to compare his statements with what actually happened in the marketplace. I mean, clearly there was volatility and a huge market drop in crypto over that 12-month period. So it, it wouldn't surprise me that, uh, you know, his leverage numbers changed perhaps even dramatically during that time period. Um, I think the problem at the heart of this is that, you know, his positions, you know, the collateral he had behind that, he didn't have the same auto liquidation provision that a margin account would normally have. You usually can't lose, you know, if it's structured properly, you shouldn't be able to lose more than your collateral. Otherwise, the position closes out and there's no harm in the brokerage firm. You know, isn't if it's a brokerage account, for example, they wouldn't be short cash. They wouldn't have to go out to get the money from you. You close out the position. None of that existed with, uh, with the Alameda positions. They had almost an, a complete ability to lose money beyond their collateral. Are you yet in a position to be able to describe, summarize the assets that Alameda had? We do have, an, you know, an inventory of uh, of uh, the investments we made. Uh, that's pretty clear. We've got those in the hands of uh, our investment bankers at Perella, and we're trying to understand those investments. Uh, ultimately, we'll market those investments. You'll see this week that some of those investments uh, will be uh, will be put up for sale. Uh, the crypto assets, a, a little bit different. Uh, what's on the exchanges, we can see. There's exchanges, about two dozen exchanges across the world where we know we have crypto assets. They're in our name. We're securing those and removing those into cold storage. Uh, we have, you know, other uh, positions in cold wallets and hot wallets. We've got visibility to that. The question really is, are there wallets that we don't know about? 
Certainly that is the potential because the way this company was organized, there may be wallets that don't have our names, we don't know where they are, and that's gonna be a, you know, a difficult task ahead of us. But what we can see and what we have visibility to, we're grabbing control over. So we'll learn more this week. We should learn more in the coming weeks. <clears throat> Mr. Ray, you mentioned the documentation that you don't have earlier during your testimony. Uh, can you share what documents you have uncovered with respect to the transfer of funds from FTX to Alameda? Uh, it's voluminous. Uh, you know, uh, the the the, you know, the record keeping uh, uh, you know wasn't very clean in the company, but we should be able to trace the movement uh, of crypto assets. I mean, inherently in the nature of the crypto, you should be able to to see the movement and where it started and where it ended up. We'll obviously track, you know, the banking information. We do have bank records. Uh, sometimes we have to go right to the source, the, right to the bank, to get historical records because they're not, uh, you know, on, in hand, if you will, uh, at the company. But but one way or another, we'll get the banking records and we'll be able to trace the sources of, of cash, how that cash was utilized to buy assets. Once we can identify the assets, we can then trace the asset from either, uh, you know, transfer to other currencies or ultimate you know, payment outside the company. So it's just a very in, intense forensic process, but we'll have the records ultimately uh, to do that. We'd be interested in receiving more detailed explanation of the documents uh, that you have. And one last question, can you describe what documents you've identified with respect to internal controls and governance? Well, th there isn't any, uh, you know, to speak of. I mean, the, the company is virtually void of any internal controls or documentation. Uh, resolutions are absent. Uh, authorizations approving massive loans, for example, the loans of the insiders. I haven't seen any resolutions approving those. When when Sam Bankman fried signs on behalf of the company and then he signs his own loan, that should tell you a lot right there. Gentlemen's time has expired. The gentleman from New York, Mr. Meeks, who is also the chair of the House Committee on Foreign Affairs, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And Mr. Ray, it's, uh, thank you for your testimony here today. And you know, if you've been a member of Congress as long as I have been, you know, it just seems eerily uh, it was you that had to take over Enron uh, when uh, I was sitting here at that particular time. Uh, and we were looking at that as being one of the biggest uh, scandals that we've ever seen. And now, I believe in your testimony today, you said this may be even bigger, of uh, which uh, is, uh, is, is really concerning to me, uh, particularly since, you know, um, I, I, I do believe that uh, blockchain technologies uh, have a role in fostering financial inclusion that facilitates cross-border transactions. But what we didn't have and what we don't have are the real safeguards against misuse by bad actors. Uh, and uh, as a result of that, I know I've been intricately involved uh, with uh, New York State. Uh, and New York State was one of the first nations to create a virtual currency license and supervisory framework. Uh, and so uh, in, in your testimony, you were very frank about the total lack of internal controls in FTX and critical of their governance structure. So uh, I guess my first question to you is in your estimation, how much did the lack of a board of directors uh, attribute to the failure of, XT, F, of FTX? And do you believe there would have been an opportunity to change course uh, if this defunct structure were identified early on? Uh, yes, I do. I think that the lack of, a, of an independent board uh, was a critical aspect of the failure. And, and also in New York State, there are capitalization requirements uh, for licensee holders to have highly liquid capital to ensure uh, that financial integrity and to protect against outside shocks. Now, in, in this instance, how uh, would a capital requirement have changed the outcome uh, of the FTX failure? Now, I, I'm not a regulatory uh, expert. I mean, what I've what I've what I've set forth in my testimony is that I think it's important for customer accounts to be segregated and for there to be transparency in what people can visualize in their account and they have you know, you know, some strict rules relative to using customer assets. That's the extent of my, you know, of my views about the regulatory scheme. I, you know, I defer to others you know, who are obviously more experienced on the regulatory side. That's one of the issues that we're trying to deal here 
is how do we get the appropriate and the proper regulation so that we can make sure that uh, individuals are protected. Uh, for example, uh, do you know and to what extent were U.S. persons trading on the FTX exchange? And do you believe that the controls were adequate in restricting access for U.S. persons? Because, you know, FTX.com was listed in the Chapter 11 bankruptcy. Uh, and despite it being publicly reported that uh, the U.S. subsidiary was a stronger and stronger position than its parent because of the narrowed offerings and oversights. Um, there still seemed to be this direction toward U.S. Uh, persons. So, uh, what do you think? Do you think that uh, 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 there should be, or the, the the restricting access for U.S. persons or the controls were adequate? Well, certainly there was a limited number of people that in invested on the on the dot com, uh, which was not intended the intended use of that exchange. Uh, how that happened, obviously, we'll have to investigate and what, what, where the breakdown was you know, internally in our controls uh, that would have allowed that to happen. So I'd like, you know, at some point, I know you're not a regulatory expert, but you know, uh, to have conversation with you about and looking at uh, some of the rules and the regulations that we put in place in the state of New York, because the debate that we have here at times is ceilings and floors and what would be appropriate to make sure that people are protected, um, and uh, you know you've already stated that FTX's lack of internal controls is unlike anything that you've ever seen uh, in your career, and obviously has had a devastating impact on people who have trusted FTX uh, with their savings and investments. I also chair the House Foreign Affairs Committee, and I'm also concerned that these internal failures could have led to sanction evasion and illegal transactions on FTX's platform at a time when sanctions compliance is critical for supporting countries like Ukraine and slowing down Putin's war machine. Have you on your team investigated these issues since taking the helm at uh, FTX about anyone trying to avoid uh, sanctions? Yeah, we're certainly investigating all the aspects of the failure and as, as the coming weeks uh, we'll learn more and I think we'll certainly be willing to you know, work with the committee to understand really what happened and share with share with you the extent possible. Gentleman's time much. has expired. The gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Lattermilk, is now recognized for five minutes. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Ray, thank you for being here today. <clears throat> Unfortunately, we aren't able to uh, question Sam Bankman-Fried. Um, I was looking forward to that. And uh, however, I was concerned that you were going to testify first. I would have rather have had him testify first so we could qualify some of the statements that he may make with, uh, with you, who's in the current position. However, since we've been in here, a, uh, there's been a leak of what was to be his testimony that has come out. And I'd like to ask you about something that he has uh, related in, in his testimony. Um, he said if he had not been arrested ahead of today's hearings, that he alleges that, that FTX, U.S., has been and remain solvent and could pay off all of its customers tomorrow. Given the evidence you have and what you've gathered, is there any degree of truth to this claim? Uh, we still have a hole in the, in the U.S. So it's, as we sit here today, it is not solvent. That's just inaccurate. Uh, and I'm not sure how would you even know that, quite honestly. So we're hopeful uh, because the, the number of uh, customers and the volume of trading on the U.S. exchange was much smaller than .com, somewhat driven by the number of withdrawals that took place before the bankruptcy on the U.S. silo. Uh, but w right now, we have a few hundred million dollars of value. Again, you have to look at value as of, say, today, right. uh, still missing. Uh, we, haven't, we haven't ultimately, though, uh, found all the keys to the wallets. As we find and open those wallets, we'll, hopefully we'll be able to find more assets. And if we can attribute those to the U.S. silo, you know, certainly there's a pathway to, to recovery there. And so, you know, the, 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 really the case isn't closed yet uh, on the U.S. It's just premature, you know, to, to make a determination such as his. So there is a potential that what he is claiming is true. But um, so is, is, I guess that would be the reason why all of the assets in those wallets have been frozen on the U.S. side. My follow-up question would be, if they are uh, solvent, why would we freeze those, you know? And along with that, um, 
is there any evidence of commingling of funds between FTX.com, uh, FTX US, or Alameda, or any of the three together? That's what we have. That's what we're looking at right now. I, I can't, you know, give you a, a clear answer on that today. Uh, we're looking when we open up all the wallets. We look where the source is from from whence they came. We'll we'll have an answer for you, but it's it's just much too okay. early to, to tell you that. I appreciate that. But summarizing, there's not evidence right now that his statement would be true that FTX US is completely solvent. Well, clearly not. Okay. And something else that he did. Previously, uh, he stated that the Bahamian regulators, he gave the Bahamian regulators a one-day advance warning to allow uh, investors in the Bahamas to withdraw their funds. No one else outside the Bahamas was able to withdraw funds before the bankruptcy was filed. Uh, Mr. Freed said that he allowed the withdrawals because, quote, it was critical to the exchange to be able to have a future because that's where I am right now. And you do not want to be in a country with a lot of angry people in it. Is this explanation accurate? Well, here's what we know. I mean, I, I can't speak to his, his words. Um, what we do know is the liquidation proceeding in the, in the Bahamas uh, was filed effectively 24 hours before our Chapter 11 proceeding. During that time period, and we've documented this in our court filings as, as of last night, uh, the accounts were unfrozen just in the Bahamas. Over $100 million was released to approximately 1,500 <laughs> customers in the Bahamas. Did you say 15 million One, or 15 million? 100 million. 100 million. To 1,500 customers approximately. Okay. These are approximate numbers. Okay. And, and then, the, then the door was closed about the time of our Chapter 11 filing. And there were communications between Mr. Beckman fried and the Bahamian government specifically related to this, uh, this leakage of, 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 of assets. So Mr. Freed would have known that the bankruptcy filing was imminent when he yes, did this? Yes, it, well, he, was, he was certainly in discussions with his counsel, who was in discussions with the debtor's counsel. All right, I see my time is quickly running out. Thank you for, uh, for what you're doing and trying to recover what assets we can. And Mr. Chairman, I yield back. The gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Gottheimer, who is also the Vice Chair of the Subcommittee on National Security, International Development, and Monetary Policy, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for convening this hearing. <clears throat> Since 2019, I have raised concern about the Securities and Exchange Commission's approach to digital assets. SEC Chairman Gensler has repeatedly claimed that most cryptocurrencies are covered by existing securities laws. Despite that, the SEC has not proposed a single rule to create guardrails for digital assets and has done a haphazard job of overseeing the space. The result has been a lack of certainty and clear rules of the road, and we are seeing the impact of that front and center today. They failed to do their job, and they failed to protect consumers, in my opinion. I've been calling on with other members on financial regulators to step up and create clear guardrails for digital assets. Nearly a year ago, I drafted the Stablecoin Innovation and Protection Act to create tough consumer protections and prevent destabilizing runs like we saw with the so-called Stablecoin Terra that failed earlier this year. I also invited Chairman Ross and Bam to my district to discuss the clear regulatory steps the CFTC could take to better protect consumers and prevent thieves and snake oil salesmen from ripping off Americans with worthless digital assets. I've consistently been engaging with all market participants, associations, and regulators to promote innovation and the responsible development of promising financial technology, all with a clear eye to protect consumers. Instead of writing clear rules and guidelines for digital asset firms, however, the SEC has created a patchwork of ad hoc policies for crypto firms purely through spotty enforcement actions and random letters. Haphazard enforcement that has missed the worst offenders. You can't regulate through a random patchwork of letters. You have to write clear rules of the road, which is what I've been calling on for years now. Chairman Gensler has told our committee and stated publicly that he is the authority he needs to oversee this industry. Yet the SEC hasn't written rules and has failed to foresee and prevent disasters in the industry and protect consumers from Terra Luna to FTX. It's time for the SEC to step up and do its job or another regulator should take the lead. Mr. Ray, thank you for being here. Do you think U.S. financial regulators would have been satisfied with the accounting and risk mitigation practices that were in place at FTX International to prevent its failure from spilling over to FTX U.S. and American investors? Uh, you know, I, I, again, I, as I said on the record, I, I can't, you know, speak to what the regulatory fix is here. Obviously, uh, 
uh, oversight is needed. Uh, obviously, we need to have customers have to have uh, control over their accounts. Um, and, uh, you know, clearly there's, uh, there's some needs here. I, I, you know, I can't, I can't really specify what they might be, and I leave that, you know, to the committee to obviously work with the agencies to... You know, FTX's groups, U.S.-based crypto derivatives and clearing platform Ledger X that has been overseen by the CFTC since 2017 was not included in FTX's wider bankruptcy filing, and according to your initial review of the situation, Ledger X is still solvent. During his testimony before the Senate Agriculture Committee last week, Chairman Benham argued that it was the oversight of his agency that ensured Ledger X was insulated from the failure of other FTX firms. From what you've seen, what, what protected Ledger X from the failures of the broader FTX ecosystem, and what could U.S. regulators, including the SEC, have done to protect Americans using FTX U.S.? Uh, you know, certainly, uh, you know, we believe Ledger X, uh, you know, it is a regulated entity and it is a solvent and uh, the customer accounts are segregated. Uh, and obviously that, that goes a long way to uh, protecting customers. Do you believe that Mr. Mankin Freed, when he says that all FTX U.S. users will receive a dollar on the dollar return of funds at the end of these bankruptcy proceedings? That's very speculative at this point. What are some of the biggest questions you still have for Mr. Bankman Freed and his associates now that you've been through this for some period? I, I think the, the questions we have are not necessarily Mr. F the question for Mr. F Freed. The questions we have are, you know, where, where are the assets? How, how we locate those assets? Uh, it's a mining exercise at this point. Uh, and uh, look, I, you know, at the end of the day, we're not going to be able to recover all the losses here, right? Uh, money was spent that we'll never get back. There will be losses on the international side. We're hopeful on the U.S. side. Um, he'll answer to others related to what happened here. Our job is just to you know, find the assets and try to get customers their money back as quickly as possible. When do you expect that to be? You know, it's, it's, these, these bankruptcies take time. The assets uh, will take time to locate. Um, the process will, as I say, will take take months, not weeks, uh, but we try to do this in the most uh, expeditious way possible. Thank you for being here. I yield back. The gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Davidson, is now recognized for five minutes. Um, Mr. Ray, thanks for what you're doing uh, to recover funds that um, are missing and for helping us build the evidence trail to find out you know, what happened. Uh, I, I think a lot of people look at your initial statements and, and you say, you know, we know the following. First, customer assets from FTX.com were commingled with assets from the Alameda trading platform. Second, Alameda used funds to engage in margin trading, which exposed customer funds to massive losses. Based on your review of the records, is the transfer of customer funds from FTX.com to Alameda Research in conflict with the FTX.com terms of service. Uh, yes, that's my view. Right, so they claim that they weren't supposed to be able to trade those funds, and clearly they traded those funds. I, I, I think that, you know, the, the, the difference in, in what's, what you may be hearing is that, uh, you know, unlike generally customer accounts, the Alameda account had no trading limitations, uh, so you know, virtually unlimited positions they could take. Right. So when, when um, customers deposited funds into their FTX accounts, where did the cash go? Well, so, sometimes the money wasn't deposited in the FTX account. It was sent to Alameda to begin with. So, so it was misdirected from, from the start straight to Alameda. Uh, there, there was certainly some time period where there's no bank account at .com. And then ultimately, uh, you know, as we, if you look at the structure of this, Alameda was essentially a customer on that dot-com exchange and effectively, you know, borrowed money from or just transferred money from FTX customers to take its own positions on the Alameda hedge fund. Right. So, so at times it was just going straight to Alameda. At other times, did you uncover a path where there was some sort of settlement, like in stocks where there's T plus two, where the... You know, there was settlement back and forth between FTX and Alameda? Ultimately, when we look at this, I mean, there is going to be, you know, I'm sure thousands and thousands of trades, right? So we're going to have to go back and, and do a very detailed analysis about every single... But they didn't have a structured settlement framework at all in any of their software or accounting systems? It, it doesn't appear so, no. 
Okay, and have you ever done bankruptcies where you had to deal with custody of stocks? Yes. Yeah, so, you know, obviously there you settle, you, clearly you own shares or you don't own shares. Uh, you take custody of the shares normally after a two-day settlement period. There's a netting period where firms that trade in these net out and settle the position at the end of the day. Uh, it doesn't seem any of this kind of thing existed for FTX. That's one of the findings. There was no uh, reconciliation of the ledger on a day-to-day -day -day basis. Um, was there anything that you could, have you detected a point in time where um, the assets on hand for this enterprise uh, matched the amount of customer deposits? Uh, we have to go back and look at that. I mean, we're, we're looking at a timeline. We, we, you know, we're going to have to back up from the petition date. Uh, my guess would be you'd have to back up for more than a year, and then we'll look at, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis. Again, they, they didn't reconcile ledger on a day-to-day -day basis. We've got to now do that to find the answer to your question. Okay, so custody really seems to be one of the big things here. Clearly, they didn't have a way to reconcile cust custody on behalf of their customers, but sometimes when people were saying, boy, you know, I don't know about this. Maybe I'm going to take my funds out. Let's say somebody bought Bitcoin, and now they want to exit with custody of Bitcoin and have self-custody, uh, is that the point in time when uh, FTX or some combination of these entities acquired the Bitcoin so that they could deliver what the customer was requesting? Well, there's a certain amount of liquidity at a point in time. I, I think the problem happened when, when there was effectively a run in the bank and there was just less, less assets there than, than, than the uh, uh, depositors effectively would require to be drawn out. Underscoring that is a commingling of those assets, even amongst the customers themselves. So it's just really one pot of crypto, if you will. Right. Okay. So no, no control, no custody, uh, and the only real safeguard the individual consumer had as this was unwinding was the hope that they could somehow be one of the lucky people that decided to say, "I'm going to take possession and self-custody my own digital asset." Uh, those people, if they've exited and they have custody of the assets, are their assets now safe? Well, you're exactly on point. I mean, if we could all be as lucky as the Bahamian customers who got the money out. All right. Thank you. My time's expired. I yield. The gentleman from Massachusetts, Ms. Presley, who is also the vice chair of the Subcommittee on Consumer Protection and Financial Institutions, is now recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair, and thank you to uh, our chairwoman for making this hearing an absolute priority. Due to the collapse of the cryptocurrency exchange, FTX, over one million people have not been made whole, including consumers in my district, the Massachusetts 7th. Now, Mr. Ray, in a bankruptcy filing a few weeks ago, you stated, quote, never in my career have I seen such a complete failure of corporate controls and such a complete absence of trustworthy financial information as occurred here, end quote, so that we can continue to get a better sight line into uh, this failure. Can you elaborate on the internal failures and the inadequate policies that occurred at FTX leading to the collapse? You know, it's, it's virtually, uh, you know, unlimited in terms of the lack of controls. Uh, uh, no centralized uh, records on, on banking. Uh, no daily reconciliations of crypto assets, uh, silos where there's no insurance, inadequate insurance, uh, no independent board, uh, no safeguards that limit who controls an asset. Uh, so senior management literally could get access to any of the accounts in any of the silos. Uh, no separateness between customer uh, money and other customer money or other other assets, uh, it's virtually unlimited in terms of the lack of controls, and that's really the, the the point of the unprecedented comment. I've just never seen anything like it uh, in 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 all 40 years of of, of, of doing restructuring work and in corporate uh, corporate legal work. Uh, it's just a dearth of of, of information. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Ray, for enumerating that for the purposes of the record uh, to better understand uh, the depth of the uh, incompetence here. Uh, and again, um, really just uh, egregious and, and, and really criminal. Um, 
Can you tell us how customer funds were handled at FTX, including the exact amount that FTX misused? We don't have what that number is. Yeah, we, we don't have totals today uh, on, on, the, on the losses. I mean, we do know that the customer funds uh, kind of existed effectively in a pool. Uh, we're going to have to do an accounting, a tracing analysis to really determine the number of customers affected. Right now, we have the number of accounts, but again, users had multiple accounts. For example, if they had a different trading uh, position, they may have opened multiple accounts. We know it's a big number. It's, it's in the millions on the customer accounts, and we know it's several billion dollars in losses. Um, assigning those losses to customer accounts will be our next challenge. And I saw one report uh, that was putting it at about $8 billion. In light of what is FTX's plan to make sure that every single dollar that was misused is returned to the customers, um, do you have an estimate of the amount of funds that FTX will actually be able to repay? You know, not at this stage. I mean, the one thing that, that I, I want to express to, to the committee is that, you know, every day we, we, we find more assets, we unlock more assets. Uh, we find, you know, keys that we can then unlock wallets, and then we assign those to the proper silos. So every day we're, you know, we're more encouraged, but, but clearly, you know, we anticipate, you know, some massive losses here. We're just too early right now to speculate what that would be. And hopefully, you know, uh, in the coming weeks, um, we will get a better handle on that and obviously make more information available to the public. Uh, the one thing about the bankruptcy process, which should be comforting to the committee, is that there's absolute transparency and disclosure in that. There's reporting in the bankruptcy process. So everyone will know every step of the way exactly what's happening in this bankruptcy. Thank you. Without question, this collapse has been devastating to people across the globe, my constituents in the Mass 7th included, uh, which is why it really is essential that uh, we understand the, the anatomy of this collapse so that we can not only ensure that they are made whole, uh, that we are mitigating the damage caused here, maximizing the value that is returned to customers, but that we ensure with stringent regulations and procedures in place uh, that this does not happen in the future. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Vice Chair, and I yield back. Gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. Budd is now recognized for five minutes. So the story of FTX is a story as old as time. Uh, what FTX engaged in, it's fraud, plain and simple. Sam Bankman Fried, he lied to investors. He violated his own terms of service. He knowingly and improperly loaned $10 billion in customer funds to FTX to his own, from FTX to his own hedge fund. This is the stuff that would make Bernie Sanders cringe. Mr. Bankman Fried is right where he belongs, arrested for fraud. And from where I sit, the number one priority right now is to make each and every investor financially whole. So thank you, Mr. Ray, for being here for your efforts and for lending your expertise today. So the bankruptcy filing, it notes several unacceptable practices, like the use of software to conceal the misuse of customer funds and Alameda's secret exemption from certain aspects of FTX.com's auto liquidation protocol. So can you expand on these practices and what more you've learned since the bankruptcy filing? Yeah, it, it, the basic concept is that, that Alameda was able to borrow on an unlimited basis uh, you know, or transfer. I'm not sure I'd call it, describe it. You know, borrowing is almost a technical term. Uh, so transfer of assets, borrowing of assets on an unlimited basis, which then it allowed was allowed to take massive positions uh, with other people's money. Uh, and because they had no auto liquidation feature, uh, ultimately those losses could exceed the value of you know, of that account. So that's, that's essentially what happened in a nutshell. Thank you. So another question, if FTX.com were domiciled here in the US, do you think the outcome would have been the same? You know, the, 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 the extent of the, of the uh, lack of, you know, of, of controls uh, uh, in the way this business was operated, I, I don't think it would matter where this company was located. So here's really what I'm getting at. So I've been a longtime supporter of both blockchain technology and the digital asset industry. I view them as uniquely American innovations that have the potential to help and revolutionize financial services. But what happened at FTX was fraud on a massive scale, not unlike other scams throughout our country's history. The head of FTX should be dealt with in the same way that 
other disgraced leaders of Enron like, prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law. So what I want to protect is innovation, and we want to see it flourish right here on our shores under proper regulatory oversight. So it's clear now more than ever that regulatory ambiguity coupled with a practice of regulation by enforcement used by agencies like the SEC, it's led to companies moving offshore where they're often out of reach of proper American oversight, which puts all investors at risk of another FTX type scam. So what we need is for Congress to take the lead and establish clear rules for this industry. From the very beginning of my time in Congress, I've introduced and supported countless bills that would do just that. And it's my hope that we can finally work together to establish these rules to protect U.S. investors in the future of American innovation. Thank you, I yield back. The gentleman from New York, Mr. Torres, is now recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. You know, to read the bankruptcy filing, one gets the impression that FTX had the corporate governance of a college fraternity. Uh, in the bankruptcy filing, you note that decisions about the disbursement, disbursement of funds were made via an online chat with personalized emojis. Um, and it seems to me corporate governance by emoji sounds like a recipe for the misuse of funds. During the New York Times deal book interview, Sam Bankman fried said that FTX and Alameda were if, quote, if not an intention, in effect, tied together more substantially than I wanted it to be. And Mr. Bankman fried speaks as if the conflict of interest came as a shock to him, as if it arose by accident or by mistake rather than by design. But it seems to me that Mr. Bankman fried set up a mutually beneficial relationship between Alameda and FTX. He would use Alameda as a market maker to generate liquidity and trading revenues for FTX and then use FTX as a lender to generate leverage for Alameda. And that incestuous relationship was neither accidental nor incidental. That incestuous relationship was central to the crypto empire that Mr. Bankman fried built. Do you agree with that analysis? Or? I can't take any exception to what you said. And so do you think that Mr. Bankman fried knew or should have known that the conflict of interest would foreseeably culminate in the commingling of customer funds? I, I certainly think he, he should have known his actions would result in the circumstances that we now find ourselves in. Absolutely. When FTX was seeking a bailout, FTX circulated to investors a balance sheet whose largest assets were tokens that FTX itself had invented. The largest asset on the balance sheet were $2.2 billion in Serum tokens. The Serum token is a creation of FTX. And needless to say, the value of a Serum token depends on the value of FTX as a company. If FTX collapses, the token is worthless, it becomes no different from monopoly money. Is there, do you agree that there's something fundamentally fraudulent about the practice of counting your own tokens as assets on your balance sheet? Well, clearly, uh, you know, because of the, uh, the, the, the way the token is created and the liquidity, uh, it, it's, it's a very, um, you know, very risky position to, to, uh, to use your own asset effectively as collateral. Well, when I think of an asset, I think of something that has value independently of the company. Just like a corporation would not count its own stock as an asset, it seems to me no crypto company should count its own tokens as an asset because if the company collapses, so does the token. Well, in terms of, of, of tokens generally, I'm not really making a judgment about you know, homegrown to tokens. Uh, they're certainly out there in the marketplace. They trade. Uh, you know, limitations on the use of, of, of your own assets as collateral certainly seems in, in inherently risky. Uh, and I suspect the customers themselves didn't realize that. So those are at least two problems. Uh, FTX reportedly holds $900 million in liquid assets against $9 billion in liabilities. These are based on media reports. Mm -hmm. And it's been reported of the liquid assets, the largest among them is about a half a billion dollars in Robinhood stock. According to the Financial Times, the Robinhood shares are controlled by a foreign entity called Emergent Entity, which is said to be personally controlled by Sam Bankman Freed. So the largest liquid asset, the Robinhood stocks, who controls it? Is it you as the FTX CEO or Sam Bankman Freed? Uh, Sam Bankman Freed does not control that asset. We, that's an asset of the estate. Okay. During the New York Times deal book interview, Mr. Bankman Freed said that he knew that there was a problem 
on November 6th, yet despite knowing what he knew on November 6th, on November 7th, he proceeded to tweet the following statement, quote, FTX has enough to cover all client holdings, leading the public to believe that there was no problem. In your view, was he telling the truth or was he lying? I, I, again, I, I, I can't, I don't want to give the dignity to his comments. Uh, you know, he also said that he had $10 billion to invest in the company that day, so. Well, let me ask the question differently. At that time when he sent out the tweet, leading the public to believe that we have enough to cover all client holdings, did FTX actually have enough liquidity, enough assets to cover their liabilities? Absolutely not. So that statement was false? Yes. Okay. And I'll leave it at that. Thank you. The gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Gonzalez, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair, and, and thank you, Mr. Ray. Um, I want to start uh, with Alameda and, and some of the loans. So Alameda took out loans from various counterparties, is that correct? Not just FTX? Yes. Okay. Um, to your knowledge, were any of those loans called? You know, we're going through the corporate history of of what was repaid, and some of those loans, in fact, I think were repaid, but they had counterparty positions with a lot of those companies as well. To your knowledge, were customer funds transferred from FTX to Alameda for the purposes of paying off called loans? Uh, that's, that's certainly possible. I mean, we need to investigate that further, but that's certainly one of the paths that we would potentially find. Thank you. Um, and then in, in your testimony, you describe the use of computer infrastructure that gave individuals and senior management access to systems. Um, that's the, I'll turn this the back door, the quote back door that we've heard about. Um, one of the things that Sam Beckman Fried has said is he had no, uh, no knowledge of commingling of funds. He said that multiple times. Um, that back door, which you've said allowed for unlimited access of Alameda, essentially unlimited access into the FTX customer accounts to fund their investments. In your eyes, is there any way that Sam Bankman-Fried or senior management wouldn't know about this sort of thing? No. Thank you. Um, now shifting towards the, the goal of the bankruptcy proceeding, which is to find the assets and return those assets ASAP. I think that's, that's the goal that we all share. Um, part of that, of course, is having the data and a paper trail that will allow you to recreate transaction histories, figure out where the, the assets are so you can actually go get them. How would you characterize the quality of the record keeping uh, at FTX and Alameda? Well, ultimately, uh, you know, we hope you know, the raw data is there, uh, and through the expertise that we have, we, we will be able to assemble it. It's, it'll be time consuming because it's raw data, uh, you know, the jump start you normally have in companies, we just don't have, so we're starting in there zero. Do you have any evidence that suggests that data was willfully destroyed uh, prior to your arrival in the company? Uh, we have imaged uh, the, the Slack environment that the company had, but uh, we are aware that uh, uh, there were certain forms of communications uh, with uh, disappearing messaging. So uh, there's obviously risk of loss there. Okay. Um, one of the things in Mr. Bankman frieds testimony that uh, has, I guess, leaked um, that, that wasn't submitted is he spends a considerable amount of time talking about Binance and how Binance effectively created a run on the bank, um, suggesting that, you know, had that not occurred, FTX was solvent and, and would have been just fine. Um, prior to that episode, is your belief that FTX was solvent? No. I didn't think so either. Um, that's pretty much all I have for questions. The one final thing I'll note, uh, also in that testimony, um, there's some accountability, which is of course good, but then there's a lot of excuse making and some complaining. Like, you know, in fact, many of us are still missing access to our own personal data which is being held hostage by the Chapter 11 team's leadership. I would note that's what happens in life when you perpetrate a massive fraud and steal billions of dollars from your customers. Um, you lose your freedom and you lose access to a whole bunch of things uh, that, that otherwise you wish you would have. 
Um, so just a simple reminder uh, for everybody uh, that that's what happens. Um, final question, actually, I do have one, one minute left. Uh, you've mentioned the $100 million that um, was transferred to 1,500 Bahamian accounts uh, prior to, to the bankruptcy. I'm not going to ask you to say this is exactly what happened, but wh what does your sort of spidey sense say about what might have gone on there? It's awfully suspicious. Uh, obviously, it's, it's, uh, it's alarming. Uh, you know, in my job, uh, I, I try to keep focused on one thing, follow the money. Uh, so we'll see, we'll investigate who received that money and what the circumstances were. Okay. Well, thank you, and, and uh, thank you again for being here. I wish you luck in, in tracking down all the customer funds, making sure they're returned to their rightful owners. Uh, and thank you, Madam Chair, I yield back. Thank you. The gentlewoman from Michigan, Ms. Talib, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you so much, Chairwoman. You know, Mr. Ray, I really appreciate you coming here. Um, you know, one of the things that kind of stood out for me is the, the, you know, how much FTX spent on celebrity endorsements and arena naming rights, really targeting residents like myself uh, and others, you know, in my community. Naming rights of the Miami Heat arena, I think you all spent like what, 135 million. NFT partnerships with the Golden State Warriors and Washington Capitals. I think 210 million uh, sponsorship of the Mercedes. I don't know, some little long line here. Endorsements and ads with Tom Brady, Naomi, Stephen Curry, Larry David. It goes on and on. Do you know the total amount of FTX, how much they spent on sport endorsements and arena naming rights? You know, we, we, have, we don't have a full tally of that because uh, uh, you know, it's just an accumulation of data. Do you know if you all spent more on FTX versus FTX.us? I, no, I don't have a, a breakdown for you, and I, and I can't tell you how much was paid in crypto versus cash. When you all ran that TV uh, the, what, during the Super Bowl, I think you doubled the number of U.S. users. Is that true? Uh, you know, I don't have data on that. Hmm. Do you think it's financially responsible that he's spending hundreds of millions of dollars on these kinds of sponsorships and quote-unquote partnerships while they were unable to cover the customer deposits? No. Personally, it sounds a lot like, you know, Houston Astros playing at Enron Park. Um, I represent the third poorest congressional district, Mr. Ray. This really impacts everyday folks like my residents who were really targeted by a lot of those ads. The crypto industry has spent millions on this marketing. And you know, one of the things I read, which was really taken aback, and I know M Madam Chair might have heard, but you know, that Ontario teacher's pension had to write off $95 million. These are teachers. And the consequences of the crypto collapse on everyday people is something that doesn't get discussed enough and understanding why accountability and oversight is, is important. That's why I really appreciate the chairwoman doing this hearing. The idea that cryptocurrency can be a solution for financial inclusion is not only laughable, it's dangerous, Mr. Ray. Um, these qu quick, rich, get quick rich kind of ads and targeting my residents, it is predatory. And quote my friend, Senator Warren, it's bullshit. And let me talk about that BS a little bit. The role of exchange tokens in the crypto industry's business model, it's reported that Almedia Media uh, held billions in you know, illiquid uh, at the FTT and then FTTX's own exchange token. Meanwhile, FTX's own website stated that FTT was the backbone of T FTX's ecosystem. I know, you're rolling your eyes. I don't know if anybody can see it. But the price of FTT traded in the high 70s over the summer but by the start of November, it hovered, I think, around $20, and then the collapse in value triggered a so-called a bank run-like situation. And then right now, FTT is, I think, valued at just over a dollar per token. Is that correct? That's correct. Clearly, FTX had an interest in inflating the value of their own token and ensure, to, it seems in hindsight, that FTX was being propped up by monopoly money. Is that correct? Uh, there, may, there may be a pattern there, yes. Mr. Ray, have you discussed in length how FTX.com is siloed from FTX.us and FTX.us users? Uh, well, st structurally they are. They, I mean, they do share uh, 
uh, a, a common environment, uh, the, the AWS system. Uh, Can FTX.us, sorry, users though, could they trade with FTT? Is that? On, the, on their particular exchange, which would be the, uh, the FTS, uh, uh, FTX US exchange, yes. So can you describe how FTTX, uh, FTT's collapse in value has affected FTX.US silo and how it's affected US con customers' residents' uh, ability to recover their funds? Uh, we don't have a full, uh, a full accounting of, of what crypto assets are within each silo that back up those customer accounts. And we need to we need to accumulate the full value of the collateral, and then we'll you know obviously look at uh, what type of crypto is there, and, and that'll be a, a, an exercise we'll have to go through. Can you explain like this whole thing around FTX's overall reliance on digital token that they control, mint, and have vested interest in manipulating the value of? That's something that I think I hope we dig deeper into. You know, I, I, I've seen stories about that and, and I've read quite a bit about it. I mean, we have not done a full investigation into what was going on in the marketplace relative to mm -hmm. you know, the various tokens. I know that's of particular interest to the regulatory community. Uh, it, you know, some of this may have played uh, into what happened uh, uh, in terms of the downfall of FTX and other crypto companies. So it's certainly something we're going to investigate. Thank you. Thank you very much. The gentleman from Tennessee, Mr. Rose, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, thank you Chairwoman Waters, and I want to also thank Ranking Member McHenry for holding this hearing, and thank you to our witness, Mr. John Ray, for lending his expertise to this committee to examine the collapse of FTX. The mismanagement of funds, the use of complex margin, and collateralization of certain digital assets, and of course, uh, alleged fraud. The timing of the events of the last 12 hours is certainly interesting. As a recovering attorney, it makes me wonder why a prosecutor wouldn't want to potentially add lying to Congress to accompany the list of charges against Mr. Bankman Free. It also makes me wonder why the SEC waited until today to file its own charges. Frankly, Chair Gensler has failed at his job, and worst of all, he has failed to protect investors, which is one of the key components of the SEC's tripartite mission. Similarly, while he has been asleep at the wheel, the Democratic majority has failed to have him to testify before this committee for over 14 months, which I believe is a disservice to investors. I hope that in a few weeks that we in the new Republican majority will finally start to hold the Biden administration accountable for their failures. Now, I see my time is limited, so I will dive right into my questions. Mr. Ray, it is my understanding that FTX and Alameda hold a number of digital assets, including more than 30 billion of Tether USDT. Can you describe the efforts that you're taking to ensure that unwinding FTX and the bankruptcy proceeding won't cause unnecessary negative impacts to these digital asset markets. Uh, at this stage, what we're doing is sequestering those assets into cold storage and securing those. Uh, we have not embarked uh, on any sort of liquidation pro process related to those crypto assets. Uh, and you know, when it comes time to look at uh, the ultimate. Uh, distribution of those assets, whether it's in cash or in kind, uh, obviously we'll be, uh, uh, we'll be instituting every procedure and process in place uh, to make sure that uh, there's no uh, depreciation of value of what we're distributing. Uh, we, our goal is to maximize the value to, uh, to customers. Thank you. Mr. Wright, you have said that, among other things, Alameda and FTX used customer funds to make investments in a variety of businesses and ventures. Have you seen any documents suggesting that the recipients of those investments did any due diligence as to the source of funds being used by FTX and Alameda? Uh, I, I've not personally seen any documentation uh, relative to other parties' due diligence. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure we would necessarily be privy to that, but we certainly haven't found anything to date. On the flip side, have you seen any indication as to whether adequate due diligence by FTX's institutional investors would have raised red flags? You know, I don't know what, what work they did. Um, I mean, obviously, they found themselves in a fairly grave position. Uh, I, I don't know what uh, 
due diligence uh, they may have done. It's hard for me to answer that. Is there any indication as to whether any potential investors before the events in November took a pass on investing after taking a hard look at FTX? Again, I, I'm not really privy to what due diligence people may have done. Uh, it's just not something that I've got visibility to. So I, I, from owning a company myself and responding, both responding to due diligence requests and making them uh, as we looked at companies, uh, we kept significant records of the due diligence, both that we requested and that we responded to. Are you seeing evidence that it, any such records were being kept by FTX? Uh, not that I'm aware. Again, you know, uh, part of my testimony is that uh, the company's record keeping uh, uh, was uh, you know, was very minimal. Uh, you know, e even as to some of the investments, we don't even have the complete transactional documents uh, that we that govern the, the investment itself. So I think that speaks somewhat for, for your, your question. And, and again, just to give you a chance to reiterate, you, from all of your experience throughout your career, you find that to be uh, remarkable, I, say, I would take it. Yeah, truly remarkable. Well, thank you uh, again for being with us today. And Chairman, thank you. I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you. The gentlewoman from North Carolina, Ms. Adams, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you, Ranking Member uh, McHenry, for hosting the hearing today. Uh, and to you, Mr. Ray, thank you for being here. <clears throat> Mr. Ray, judging by the reaction of my colleagues, it's clear how frustrated we are. Uh, especially given your testimony where you state that you ha had never seen such an utter failure of corporate controls at every level of an organization. So, Mr. Ray, um, uh, my question, my colleagues and I have asked repeatedly about your efforts to recover customers' assets, and you've told us today it'll take some time. But you're the expert here. Do you genuinely believe that these customers are ever going to get their money back? Well, certainly, we're we're working hard to you know cover all of the assets uh, and to sequester those uh, for ultimate return to customers. Uh, it's obviously a, a challenge. Uh, it's a massive loss. Uh, it's very speculative right now what that recovery will be. Uh, it's too early to tell what the ultimate recovery will uh, 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 will be to each particular customer. Uh, at some point, we'll obviously know that, and we hope obviously to maximize that. Well, okay, it doesn't sound like you, you really think they're going to get their money back. But let me, um, uh, you know, do you think that some of the losses suffered by these investors are simply a result of the nature of investment and risk-taking in the market, or, or was this fraud? Well, certainly I think the way the company operated lended itself to, you know, materially risky losses, uh, positions, uh, you know, I clearly a, a better run company uh, would have had controls and procedures in place to avoid losses. Okay, thank you, sir. Let me let me revisit the quote from your testimony. Uh, I want you to touch on the quality of FTX's bookkeeping. Was there a discrepancy between what it disclosed to its investors versus what was going on in the company internally? And can you provide an update on your efforts to to fill those gaps? Right. Well, the, the quality of the of the record keeping was was very poor in the company. Uh, we still don't have uh, you know complete financial statements for every one of the entities. Uh, we're going back and rebuilding those right now. Uh, our process is to you know to have a beginning you know entry with our assets and, and cash and our liabilities, and we'll do that on an entity by entity basis. Uh, in in the coming months uh, through the bankruptcy process. Uh, there'll be disclosures about the financial status of every one of the entities, uh, but that's a process that we'll build out over, you know, the next uh, four months. So in your testimony, you discussed the existence of a computer infrastructure that gave senior management personnel access, personal access to, to customer funds and lacked security controls. So can you describe examples of the misuse of customer funds that took place as a result of these vulnerabilities? Well, the, the, the main misuse is just simply taking customer funds and using it for, for other purposes. I mean, obviously there's investments made, payments made, 
expenditures uh, that were made with customer funds, and then obviously trading that occurred that caused losses that ultimately harmed the customer. All right, thank you so much, Madam Chair, I yield back, thank you. Thank you very much. The gentleman from Wisconsin, Mr. Stio, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, Mr. Ray, for being here. Uh, there's a lot of questions about early stage due diligence, about why uh, the indictment and the timing of that indictment by justice. But I think as policymakers, we're here to understand the FTX collapse and what can be done to prevent a future fraud like this from ever occurring again where individuals lost their money. It's complicated by the fact that FTX is domiciled in a foreign jurisdiction, and by all indications, Mr. Bankman Freed is also in a foreign jurisdiction at this time. And so we should ask ourselves tough questions as to why a company like FTX would choose to set itself up in the Bahamas rather than the United States in the first place. I think that's a question for Congress. And also, we can't lose sight of the fact that millions of Americans lost money in this. I'm outraged. I think you're outraged. The American people should be outraged. Let me dive in. A day after FTX filed for bankruptcy, multiple outlets reported that there was a hack or a potential theft. You have stated unauthorized access to certain assets occurred and that the company was in touch with law enforcement officials and regulators. Have you determined whether, in fact, assets were moved out after the bankruptcy? Yes, clearly there was assets moved out uh, after the bankruptcy. And do you know whether or not that was an actual hack, or was this done, as has been reported, at the direction of the Bahamian authorities? It was both. It was both. And so some was done, uh, some, some was done as a result of a, of a hack, some was done as a result of the request of the Bahamian authorities. Yes, that's right. And do, do you have indications as to why the Bahamian authorities made that request? Well, it wasn't a request. They just took it. The, the Bahamian authorities took the funds that were at FTX yes. through their own action. Was no action required by they, FTX they were, employees? Were, Maybe you could provide just they, a little they were, they were aided by the ex-employees, yes. They were aided by former employees yes, of Mr. FTX. Eric, yes, Mr. Wang and Mr. Freed. Is, is, is it in the, the eyes of the Bahamian authorities did this to protect clients uh, and creditors? What was the, what was the do, you, do you have insight into the motivation uh, behind this action? Unlike the Chapter 11 process, there's no transparency in, in, the, in the process in the Bahamians, and we've repeatedly asked them for clarity about what they've been doing, and we've been shut down on that. So from you, you've requested insight as to why this was done from the Bahamian authorities, and the Bahamian authorities, their reply to you was that they did not reply, or they, they, they replied and it was unsatisfactory? The, the, they, they put out statements that it was in the interest of uh, the Bahamian creditors, um, although you know, our view is that it violated the automatic stay in bankruptcy. And so you have questions that still remain unanswered by the Bahamian authorities that would shed additional light into your investigation if that information was provided? Yes. Do you, do you believe that if, at that time Mr. Bankman Freed was attempting to undermine Chapter 11 cases by expanding the scope? by moving assets to accounts under the control of the Bahamian authorities? It appears so. So it appears that he may be working to undermine uh, the scope of federal bankruptcy, U.S. federal bankruptcy law. That's what it appears, yes. And so then do you still believe that the, the Chapter 15 case should be consolidated in the Delaware Bankruptcy Court? Uh, no, I do not think so. What do you think should be... What, what do you think would be the best course of action? Uh, they, they have a liquidation proceeding relative to FTS Digital Markets. Uh, they filed that proceeding there. That is their proceeding. Uh, we think the Chapter 11 process is the only open, transparent process that, that gives visibility to customers of what happened and when they're going to get their money and how they're going to get their, their money. The, the process in, in the, in the in, in the Bahamian Islands is, is not a transparent process. Uh, we have opened up the ability to share everything that we have uh, with the Bahamian uh, government, similar to how we share with other uh, liquidators around the world. Not only in this case, in other cases, it's meant to be a very cooperative uh, situation. Uh, the, the pushback that we've gotten uh, is sort of extraordinary in the context of bankruptcy. Uh, it raises questions. It seems irregular to me. There's lots of questions on our part, and obviously we're investigating it. 
I, I appreciate your candor on that point. I think that's a really important point that we look at. And again, one of my concerns is, is we look at overall crypto policy, shifting away from this specific bankruptcy, is that we have a large number of crypto companies that have chosen to domicile outside the United States rather than inside the United States, and a, a lack of a regulatory framework inside the United States, my concern is that's moving people to be offshore. And when they're offshore, when a fraud like this occurs, it's to the detriment of Americans who have placed their money in trust of a company like FTX. I appreciate you being here, cognizant of my time, I yield back. The gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Lynch, who is also the chair of the Task Force on Financial Technology, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, Mr. Ray. I appreciate your, your patience uh, with us today and, uh, and, and your, your uh, testimony. Uh, recently, we received a, a leaked copy of uh, uh, Mr. Bankman-Fried's intended testimony. Uh, apparently, it was leaked to Forbes. Uh, basically, he continues to allege that this was all an accident that was unintentional on his part, that he was unaware of his company's, uh, various companies' activities. Uh, however, as, as my colleagues have pointed out previously, this, this you know, structuring, as you have said, of these uh, four silos of, of, of companies, the location in Bahama, in the Bahamas, uh, indicates a, a deliberate attempt to avoid U.S. jurisdiction and, and U.S. security laws. So uh, in our, our conversations with uh, Mr. Gensler uh, of the SEC last week, he indicated that there are laws in place that would have protected investors and customers uh, had Mr. Bankman-Fried decided to register uh, his, his offshore operations here in the United States. Is that, is that your understanding? You know, I'm not familiar with the regulations he's speaking to. I'm, I'm in, you know, obviously there was an absence of regulation relative to these operations, so uh, clearly any regulation would have helped. The Southern District of New York also unsealed its criminal indictment this morning, which alleges that Mr. Bankman-Fried lied to investors. He now faces about eight counts, including wire fraud on customers and lenders and conspiring to defraud the U.S. and violate campaign campaign finance laws. Uh, do you have any information that would would uh, countervail those those uh, charges? Uh, is there anything that you've seen in the way that Mr. Bankman Fried structured this company or uh, in any way that he tried to uh, comply with with uh, with US securities law? in your, your uh, investigation so far? I mean, we, we've certainly made our, all of our information available to the regulators and the enforcement agencies, and, and obviously they're seeing what we're seeing. What I'm trying to get at is, is that uh, while Mr. Bankman-Fried continues to say this was an accident, it, it appears to me at every step of the way that, uh, that his acts were intentional, they were willful, and these were, were conscious decisions made by him in structuring his company as he did. I, I, I don't know what his intent was. I certainly know what the results were, and they're disastrous, obviously, for customers. I realize that only, uh, well, at least so far, the reports say that only about 2% of the people defrauded uh, in this, uh, in the FTX collapse, were from the United States. Is that correct? You know, I don't know how they're calculating that number is that on a customer basis, a value basis. I, I, it's hard to comment on it. We do know that, that the, you know, the U.S. investors were on the U.S. exchange, and the relative losses there are a fraction. Uh, but it's too early to tell exactly how much those losses are in either silo. Um, I, there is a, a general truth to the statement that, that the U.S. will suffer, that particular exchange will suffer less than the dot-com exchange, purely because of the siphoning off of, of of cash and assets uh, from uh, from dot com over to Alameda. There also seem to be, despite the structural differences between these different operations, uh, you know, FTX.com, FTX US, uh, 
there is, without, without a doubt, a, a barrage of uh, advertisements, endorsements, especially in the minority communities where Bankman Freed admitted that he was trying to uh, supposedly bank the unbanked with, uh, with access to F FTX. Uh, is, is that how the U.S. citizens were, were sort of swept up into this? Uh, do you have any indication that that was the process? Um, they do heavily. Uh, th there's a lot of uh, a lot of hype around around crypto. Uh, there were, uh, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars were spent on advertising to U.S. citizens on FTX. I'm just wondering if that was what drew some of these victims into this this uh, disaster. Uh, you know, I don't I don't have a professional view of that. I, I think uh, your own observations will guide you there. Okay. Well, my time has expired. Madam Chair, I yield back. Thank you. Thank you. The gentlewoman from Pennsylvania, Ms. Dean, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you to the ranking member for uh, hosting this important hearing at an extraordinary time uh, in the cause of this, this case. So, Mr. Ray, uh, I want to just make sure we set the stage, which is that no matter what, the failure, the fraud, the infliction of pain on people is extraordinarily real. As intriguing, as disastrous, as the events leading up to the filings of bankruptcy are. And of course, you have the task of, of trying to recapture the assets and protect them and transparently convey them back to folks as best as possible. So all that is outrageous. I'd like to focus uh, my time a little bit on what happened on the 11th and the 12th of November. You say in your testimony, I'm going to cite both your testimony and the declaration of the filing yesterday in court, uh, that you, were, uh, you accepted the position of chief executive officer for FTX Group in the early morning hours of November the 11th and quickly realized bankruptcy filing was necessary, which began that day. You also say that as the cases were filed, debtors and their representatives worked tirelessly through the night to secure assets. You then go on in this last yesterday's pleading, uh, trying to block what uh, the other liquidator was trying to do, to say that during this period, on the 11th and the 12th, as best I can build this, information emerged that debtor systems and assets were accessed from at least two sources. What are those two sources? Uh, well, there was two, two situations going on. One is there was a, a hacking by a third party. Uh, we are tracing that hacking, you know, using our own cyber teams. Plus, we're being assisted by the government in tracking the ultimate, you know, location of those crypto assets. And the other thing that happened at the same time was that, aided with uh, resources of uh, our former management, uh, the Bahamian government took control of certain uh, crypto assets. Bahamian Commission. Yes. Uh, instructed Mr. Bankman Freed and Wang to mint, what does that mean, to mint a substantial number of new tokens and transfer hundreds of millions of dollars worth of these new tokens uh, to cold storage for their benefit. So the, the, what that refers to is that uh, it's mentioning the FTT, which is a, a coin created by the company. It could literally be minted. You could create new money with it. Uh, and so in that process, uh, FTT was transferred uh, to uh, uh, the Bahamian authorities. To the tune of how much money? Uh, pr approximately uh, uh, I, I well, read here less than, about, about 300 million. 300 million. Uh, and you said that would be Mr. Bankman Fried and Mr. Wang who did that minting and transferring. And it's I know, I know I, I, we have information that they were both involved, uh, whether Mr. Wang did it or Mr. Freed. You know, it, obviously they were cooperating with the government in doing so. And this is post bankruptcy filings. It, it post bankruptcy, you know, when the automatic stay was in effect. Uh, that kind of wrongdoing, for somebody of your expertise, uh, how is it that the walls were not secure? Uh, that someone was able, in this case one unknown and the other known, likely known, was able to go in, uh, mint, manufacture, 
tokens and transfer them to a foreign government? Uh, it really goes back to the, you know, the, the control of the company and its assets in the hands of a few people, in this case, wrongdoers. They held the keys and they knew where the wallets were and there's just a lack of documentation and internal controls of separateness between the company's assets, who held the keys, uh, and they were able to, to, to take those assets uh, purely by the way the company was established. And post uh, the 11th or 12th, has that kind of access to the keys, minting, transferring, uh, stopped? Uh, we haven't seen any evidence of, of hacking. Uh, we've, we've certainly have isolated uh, any involvement of uh, the former founders from the company, whether that's cash or other assets. Uh, what we don't know, right, is, is whether or not the founders uh, could have taken crypto and put it in a cold wallet that we just don't have an awareness of. And if they did, you know, hopefully we can, we can trace that. We may find in the billions of, of, of data that we have uh, a trail there, uh, but it's possible that uh, assets would have escaped the system and maybe exist in a, a thumb drive that we just don't have knowledge or possession of. I thank you, Mr. Ray, and uh, thank you for your team's work. Thank you very much. The gentleman from New York, the gentlewoman from New York, Ms. Ocasio-Cortez, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you very much, and thank you for coming here to testify today, Mr. Ray. I have a lot to get through, so we're going to try to get these answers as quickly as possible. Um, I want to put together a little bit of a timeline of this collapse between November 12th and yesterday. On November 2nd, we have Coindesk leaking these balance sheets. On the 8th, Binance signs a non-binding letter to acquire FTX, and uh, Bankman Freed freezes or pauses withdrawals from FTX. I would like to submit to the record your declaration to the U.S. Bankruptcy Court, or FTX's uh, declaration to the U.S. Bank Bankruptcy Court that was filed yesterday. Um, now, on November 9th, the day after those assets were frozen, Binance announced it would not go through with the purchase, and according to this filing, the same day, Bankman Freed emailed the Bahamanian Attorney General with an offer. That offer stated uh, that he would offer to unfreeze withdrawals just for Bahamanian customers on FTX Quote, so they can tomorrow fully withdraw all their assets. Correct. Is that correct? Yes. Now, on November 10th, FTX DM, the next day, was placed into a foreign provisional liquidation in the Bahamas. Correct? Correct. The next morning. Now, after that, Bankman Freed then made good on his offer, on his previous day's offer, in that email to the Bahamanian AG, opening withdrawals just in the Bahamas for a period of 25.5 hours. Is that correct? Correct. Now, during that period, $100 million was, was withdrawn in the Bahamas from FTX by 1,500 individuals, correct? Correct. And this was before, this was the day before you were set to take over. So he was still in control. This was like right before he was supposed to hand correct. this off. Now, I think what we have here is that uh, or rather afterwards, on November 12th, we have what uh, Congresswoman Dean was just asking about with this additional minting, this, these questions around this additional minting. And then on November 16th, the Bahamanian appointed joint provisional liquidators did something very interesting. They came here to the United States Bankruptcy Court uh, and sought an entry to recognize the Bahamanian liquidation as the main foreign proceeding. Would that additional control be of any potential value to Mr. Bankman Freed for that Bahamanian proceeding to be the main one? Well, it, clearly, you know, there, there seemed to be an effort um, by uh, the Bahamian Commission to get control of, of the bankruptcy mm -hmm. process, and I think that was evident by their filing, which, by the way, was made up in New York, not Delaware. Oh, thank you. Thank you for that correction. Um, now, did you uncover any evidence that demonstrates that this window, that 25.5 hour window, opened in exchange for any consideration offered to Mr. Bankman Freed by the Bahamanian Attorney General or any state official, including a promise to initiate liquidation proceedings which might offer a path towards Mr. Bankman Freed retaining some control or influence over FTX.com. We intend to investigate that very thing. 
Thank you very much. Now I'd like to dig into a little bit of the timeline of yesterday. Yesterday, you filed uh, that same declaration uh, that revealed some of this explosive information. What time did you file this? Uh, that was uh, Around what time? Yeah, three or four o'clock. Around day. three or four o'clock. Now, when you file this information, that requires, that essentially discloses that you are sharing this information, and it, it discloses that to opposing counsel, correct? Yes, we docket it, and the world knows about it. Now, if opposing counsel uh, essentially becomes notified of this, um, that would mean that Bankman Freed and potentially Bahamanian officials would have been potentially privy to that information starting around 3 or 4 p.m., correct? Correct. What time was um, uh, Mr. Bankman Freed arrested yesterday? Uh, I, I believe it was uh, in, in the early evening hours, after 4 o'clock. So About, I think, I believe it was, seven around, perhaps. It was in the evening, after yes. that filing. 6, 7 o'clock, yes. I would like to submit to the record the statement from the Attorney General of the Bahamas issued yesterday on the arrest of Mr. Uh, Samuel Bankman Freed. And um, after submitting that to the record, I would like to note that, this, that in this statement, they stated at such time as a formal request for extradition is made, presumably by the, by the Southern District of New York, but they do not state when that request for extradition was made. Do you believe that information is important for us to understand in order to piece together a timeline, Mr. Ray? Yes, sir. I, I certainly don't have uh, that full timeline, and, and that's something that we look forward to learning. Thank you very much. Thank you. The gentlewoman from Texas, Ms. Garcia, who is also the vice chair of the Subcommittee on Diversity and Inclusion, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Mr. Ray, and thank you for your patience today as we come towards the end of this hearing. Um, let me just say that uh, I was one city controller of Houston, and under me was the city auditor, so I've done a lot of audits, <coughs> overseen a lot of audits, and this has got to be one of the most ridiculous, loosely goosey operation I've ever seen. I wouldn't be surprised if you come back and tell us you found money under somebody's mattress, uh, because it seems like there was total lack of controls, total lack of transparency, total lack of any accountability. Um, and it's much like a, an onion that every time you peel a layer, it gets a little smellier and uglier. So I, I, I know we need to stay tuned. I wanted to also go over a little t quick timeline uh, following up on, on uh, my colleagues' questions. And FTX International was founded before a FTX US, correct? Okay, I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? FTX International was put together before FTX US. Yes. So before FTX US, US customers were not didn't have a forum or a platform uh, to participate in because, as I understand it, FTX International was for non-USA customers. That's correct. So do you happen to know how many FTX US customers there really is? We, we don't have an accurate customer account. We do have a user number, which is about 2.7 million. But uh, do, customers did have multiple accounts, and some of those accounts have zero balances. So 2.7 million. Right. Uh, we were told that it, uh, I saw some information that said that it was about, I think it was 2% of the total picture of FTX uh, customers. Is that about Yeah, I, I don't know how they're calculating that. I mean, on a relative basis, though, the, the U.S. number of U.S. users and the value at the petition date, you know, is, is, is a relatively small compared to DECOM. Well, I've been, been curious to find out, and I've asked this question of the uh, White House Working Group and a number, number of people that have appeared before us just about this whole crypto space. Um, who is the consumer here? Who are the people being harmed? I'm not talking about hedge fund managers. I'm not talking about investors. I'm not talking about entities. How many real people are being hurt? Well, we, we haven't... Uh we don't, we don't have a breakdown by, say, institution versus individual. I, you know, clearly, there's a lot of individuals harmed by this, a lot of individual accounts. Uh, you know, crypto accounts are, are, current, are, are, are certainly a, uh, uh, you know, something that you know, it's available to, to consumers. So I would expect that the population will include 
a large amount of consumers. So when you say that, are you telling me you have no consumer data, you just have account numbers right now? We have account numbers. We can we can ultimately you know figure out the names associated with those accounts. What we don't know, of course, if necessarily is uh, uh, you know what the identity necessarily is behind some of those account names. Uh, so you don't have any information on their demographics or states. You can't tell me about not, not my district. Yeah, not at my you fingertips. Can't tell Mr. Agrippas if there's any from his district. Not at my not at my fingertips. We certainly can accumulate that and break that down. Well, I would be really interested because obviously for many of us, it is our constituents that we want to make whole while we have a concern for the entire crypto space and all of the uh, people who participated in, in uh, uh, any of these trades on their platforms. We have a deeper concern, if you will, uh, for our own constituents. Uh, and we need to make sure that, that we do make them whole. And I know in response to a previous question, you said you weren't sure when you'd be able to make everyone whole. Is that answer the same for the people from, for just the US, or is that also the same for the people in the FTX International? It, it, it's same for all, you know, for all the customers. I mean, obviously the extent of the harm appears greater uh, on the international side. So, uh, um, you know, we're hopeful again on the US side that uh, uh, the, the dissipated assets are not significant, and that obviously would lead to a greater recovery and a sooner recovery. Uh, but it's a little bit premature to, to really nail that down today. Well, thank you. And, and I, I, when you do the demographics and the, the consumer data, uh, keep in mind that a uh, morning consult study showed that about a quarter of black and Latino respondents own the cryptocurrencies. It's a quarter compared to 70%, 17% of white respondents. This, we need to make sure that when we talk about making everybody whole, we're talking about everybody. Absolutely. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you very much. The gentleman from South Carolina, Mr. Timmons, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Ray. Um, let's go back to Enron. That trial was from January 30th, 2006 until May 25th, 2006. Pretty lengthy trial. Um, I imagine that the federal prosecutors presented ample evidence. There were all kind of witnesses. Um, would it have been helpful to have um, the defendant testify before Congress for like six hours and answer a whole bunch of questions under oath prior to that trial? Would that have been helpful to federal prosecutors? Well, it, it, by, by, by that time, uh, the company had been confirmed out of bankruptcy. Uh, we, we had before, before he was arrested, would it have been helpful for him to come before Congress and testify for hours on end and answer every question that we could come up with? Oh, absolutely. Under oath? absolutely yeah. So it would have been really helpful. Yeah, oh yes. Okay, okay. So um, why 36 hours before he was scheduled to testify before this committee for hours on end, did the Southern District of New York send a provisional arrest warrant to the Bohemian government to facilitate his arrest, to preclude his testimony, which would have been incredibly helpful in the prosecution of Sam Bankman fried I mean, I, I, I obviously can't speak for the, you know, for the agency. It's kind of bizarre. I mean, I was a prosecutor for a number of years. I prosecuted complex white collar cases. The thought of getting six hours of congressional grilling for a target of investigation or a defendant, um, that would be great for my case. Um, so I just don't understand, I guess the, the grand jury returned uh, the indictment on the 9th. Technically, you can delay weeks if you want to. So this was a decision made by somebody at DOJ to prevent Sam Bankman Freed from coming here in a couple hours and testifying before Congress, answering questions in front of the American people. Uh, I've read his alleged testimony that he was going to give. He's basically saying that he lacks the criminal intent. He lacks mens rea. He's saying that his attorneys pressured him into filing Chapter 11, that he immediately, after doing a docu-sign to sign away everything, said, I don't want to do that, told his attorneys, again, this is all what he says, um, told his attorneys that undo it, I do not want to do that. And it seems that he's been taking steps ever since that to try to wrangle control of, of his companies back. Is that fair to say? You, you know, I, I, I can only... I can only 
read what you read in the, in the, in the press. I haven't talked to Mr. Um, <clears throat> so my friend from Wisconsin was talking about uh, chapter 15 versus chapter 11. And that's basically the, the Bohemian government or uh, outside, uh, what do they call it? Joint provisional liquidators are trying to wrangle control of this bankruptcy. Um, is that fair to say? It seems that way, yes. And arguably, um, you're going to be going after the $100 million that was uh, allowed by 1,500 Bohemian citizens to take out that was allegedly owed. You're still going to get to the bottom of that. So you plan on going after that money, correct? We'll investigate every potential cause of action. And if 1,500 people in the Bahamas were allowed 25 and a half hours to withdraw $100 million, do you plan on trying to get that back and distribute it appropriately? Yeah, we will certainly pursue every course of action to recover. Okay. Um, so where do you go from here? You're obviously going to do everything you can to maintain control of it and keep it in Chapter 11. Is that fair to say? It is fair to say. I mean, you know, we think the bankruptcy process here is the one place that has transparency and has the greatest ability to maximize value for creditors. But these things aren't usually mutually exclusive. We work with liquidators all the time on a cooperative basis. Uh, so this is a little bit unprecedented. I think that's fair to say. This is going to be a law school exam for many students in years to come. Um, I'll end with this. I really look forward to figuring out why the Department of Justice um, issued the provisional arrest warrant to preclude Sam Bankman fried from testifying before us this afternoon. Um, I do not understand it. Uh, as a former prosecutor, the thought of him going on the record for three, four, five hours and answering every question to try to keep his uh, alleged uh, mens rea out of this would be wonderful. So I look forward to figuring out why they did that. With that, Madam Chair, I yield back. Thank you. The gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Garcia, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, uh, Chair Waters and Ranking Member McHenry for hosting this important hearing. And thank you, Mr. John Ray, for joining us today. Uh, I want to start by zooming out a bit because FTX isn't an anomaly. It's a collapse, uh, is just the case of one, isn't just a case of one corrupt guy stealing money. It's about an entire industry that refuses to comply with existing regulation that thinks it's above the law. It is not. As we speak, Binance is being investigated by the Department of Justice. Tether is being investigated by DOJ as well. The SEC is, is investigating the co-founder of Terra Luna, which collapsed earlier this year, and Digital Currency Group has many of the same conflicts of interest present in the FTX case. The crypto industry is in crisis because crypto assets have no inherent value. These companies are making money using one thing, hype. And when the hype runs out, these businesses fail, and ordinary investors, especially latecomers who are disproportionately low-income Black and Latino, lose. Mr. Ray, in your November 17th filing, you noted that your team had detected unauthorized minting of approximately 300 million in FTT tokens by an unauthorized source after the bankruptcy petition date. Your December 12th filing notes that while one source of this unauthorized minting remains under investigation, a second source has been confirmed without doubt. Who was the source of this unauthorized minting that your team has confirmed without a doubt? Uh, the, the second source I think you're referring to is the uh, Bahamian Commission. And Mr. Ray, uh, one of the unacceptable management practices at FTX that you identified was the absence of independent governance throughout the FTX group. People from the same group were leading various companies and there were potential conflicts of interest because of this. Could you tell us more about the risk, the lack of independent governance and what risks were created as a result? Uh, 
we had no independent board of directors, and, and with the lack of, of, of oversight by an independent board, it leaves uh, the, the company in the hands of a small group of individuals, and the company is effectively sort of naked when it, when it comes to internal controls. So that was certainly the case here, uh, and it's, it's uh, something that uh, you know, is an atypical of uh, companies of this size. And customers report, and you've confirmed during the hearing that FTX was asking customers to send money to Alameda instead of FTX. Mr. Bankman Freed claims this is because in the early days of FTX, the company did not have a bank account. On a Twitter space yesterday, Mr. Bankman Freed said he does not know if assets were moved over from the Alameda to FTX after those early days. To your knowledge, how long were customers instructed to send funds to Alameda that were meant for FTX? We, we don't have a precise timeline uh, of, 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 of that, that circumstance. Uh, that's one of our investigations. Uh, we'll certainly look to what kind of communications were, were given to customers. Uh, did they know? Did they actually have knowledge of, of that direction? Uh, those are all questions. And were the assets ever moved over to FTX or were they allowed to stay with Alameda? Uh, there were certainly certain assets were stayed with, with the exchange, uh, in, effectively in a pot, if you will. Uh, but clearly uh, assets moved to uh, uh, Alameda or those assets were there uh, you know, continuously. Uh, so you know, clearly there was a, uh, an allocation uh, to Alameda of customer funds that were utilized for other purposes. Thank you, sir. Uh, Madam Chair, I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you so very much. The gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Auchincloss, who is also the vice chair of the full committee, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Mr. Ray, I appreciate your patience and, and diligence this afternoon in asking and uh, answering these long questions. Um, you've, you've addressed everything with care and thought. You haven't played any video games while you're talking to us, so it's terrific. Um, Mr. Bankman Freed leaked his written testimony to Forbes today. Uh, just one more link in a long chain of dissembling and, and lies from Mr. Bankman Freed. Uh, so I think it's important to allow you to respond to anything he put in there on, on the record here with us. He really makes two pointed uh, assertions. One is that you haven't engaged with him and haven't allowed him access to his passwords and accounts. Can you explain uh, to the committee now why that is the appropriate course of action? Uh, well, for a couple of reasons. I mean, first of all, uh, we wanted an independent you know, examination. Uh, we didn't want to rely on people who were potentially compromised. And as we now sit here today, we know that was a wise decision, right? Yes. Second of all, uh, what he was asking for fundamentally was to allow access to a system that we know just hours after the bankruptcy filing, he had dissipated assets from the estate. Uh, so it, it, it's I think that's, those two are sufficiently good reasons I'll reclaim. The second broad point he makes is that were he allowed to, were he allowed to restart FTX, he could raise the financing and make customers whole. That's, I think, a, a, a fair paraphrasing of what he's asserting. Again, can you respond to that and whether that's, that's true and credible? Yeah, you know, in my, my history of, of doing corporate restructurings, I, I don't find that remotely believable because the first thing an investor would have to do is pay several billion dollars just to have the company you know, back to the position it was in. So it's, it's, it's a fantastic idea. It would be throwing good money after bad in the, in the biggest sense of the word, right? Correct. Uh, good, thank you. I just wanted to give you that opportunity. Uh, and I also want to associate myself with the, the, the very thoughtful line of questioning from both uh, Ms. Ocasio-Cortez and, and Mr. Timmons, actually, from both sides of the aisle on the timeline here, and I'll just reiterate the timeline quickly. Uh, on November 6th, FTX Group was facing a liquidity crisis. On November 8th, FTX withdrawals were halted. On November 9th, Mr. Bankman Freed sent an email to the Attorney General of the Bahamas saying the Bahamian customers could make withdrawals as they had, quote, segregated funds for all Bahamian customers, end quote, despite his awareness of FTX's withdrawal halt. 
And then on November 10th, two days after withdrawals were halted, nearly $100 million in cryptocurrency was withdrawn by those, quote, asserting to be Bahamanian customers. Um, and then, quite conveniently for Mr. Bankman Fried's counsel, uh, he is arrested right before he was due to provide hours worth of sworn testimony to Congress. Um, Mr. Ray, do we have your commitment that as you continue to unravel these, these, this ball of yarn and, and pull on these re relative threads here, that if you find any evidence of improper collusion between Mr. Bankman Freed and any authorities in the Bahamas or elsewhere, that you will make that known to us? Absolutely. Thank you. And I want to close uh, really with comments directly to the, to the broader industry here. Um, and I've long said that I'm neither a crypto bull nor a bear. Uh, my job as a policymaker is not to deliver new products or, or technology, but rather to advance laws and regulations that protect consumers, that preserve market integrity, and advance the US dollar as the world's reserve currency. And I maintain this market and tech agnostic position. I think it's the appropriate one. We need strong and clear regulations here from Washington. But I do want to say that my patience with the crypto bulls is wearing thin. It's been 14 years, and the American public has heard lots of promises, but it has seen lots of Ponzi schemes. For crypto, it's time to put up or shut up. It's worth noting that ARK, the innovation investor, several years ago identified five general purpose technologies of the future. DNA sequencing, artificial intelligence, robotics, energy storage, and blockchain. And yet those first four disruptive technologies have already delivered game-changing innovation that affects my constituents in daily life. Blockchain has thus far delivered white papers and podcasts about Bitcoin and DAOs and NFTs, DeFi and more. And it's all interesting, it's exciting even, but none of it has achieved product market fit at scale. And it's time for the blockchain investors and entrepreneurs to build things that matter or to lose more credibility. Madam Chair, I yield back. Thank you very much. Without objection, I would like to enter into the record the closing statements from Ranking Member McHenry and myself. Uh, and I'd like to thank you, Mr. John Ray III. Chairwoman for Waters. Your presence here today. Chairwoman Waters, I've not had an opportunity to testify or to question the witness. Uh, I'd like to um, thank you for your presence. Chairwoman Waters. And for the Parliamentary inquiry. Yes. Are all members entitled to question witnesses? You are, and if you would like to miss the votes on the floor for everybody. Hey, it's just the chairwoman's moment. prerogative to call just a recess. Just one moment, please. That's your decision, not mine. Just one moment, please. You may go right ahead and have five minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. You're certainly welcome, sir. Mr. Ray, earlier today you said FTX was one of the worst bankruptcies you have handled in your 40 years of legal and restructuring experience. Under Mr. Bankman Freed, FTX had almost no record keeping, risk management, or accounting. In fact, FTX had zero accountants on their payroll. Mr. Bankman Freed explained to Bloomberg Businessweek that FTX's accounting was done by him and in his head, quote, I was real lazy about the mental math. The complete lack of any basic record keeping makes it difficult to track down assets and untangle this mess. Are you aware of any additional wallets the co-founders potentially have access to that contain debtor assets? Uh, no, we're not. There's also been very little attention to the banks that FTX had a relationship with. I don't know that I've heard about any questions today, but the ties between FTX and Farmington State Bank began in March when Alameda Research invested $11.5 million in the bank's parent company, FBH. Do you have any insight or additional information as to why a small agricultural lending bank with really no footprint in fintech or crypto has a relationship with FTX? Uh, no, that's the subject of our inquiry. I mean, we do know, obviously, we made that investment. Well, thank you. I uh, appreciate that. You've also stated that Alameda's business model as a market maker required deploying funds to various third-party exchanges, which were inherently unsafe and further exacerbated by the limited protections offered in certain foreign jurisdictions. To your knowledge, are any of the FTX co-founder or their family members affiliated with third-party exchanges that receive funds from Almeida? We're certainly investigating that. It's gonna take some time to dig through that, but that's clearly a part of our focus. Thank you. Um, I appreciate you coming here today, and I'd like to yield the balance of my time uh, to the ranking member, Mr. McHenry. I, I yield back. Thank you.
Thank you. As I was saying before, without uh, objection, I would like to enter into the record the closing statements from Ranking Member McHenry and myself. I would like to thank you so very much, Mr. John Ray, for the time that you have spent here today in the way that you had helped us. And with that, I would recognize the, the Ranking Member for a minute. Um, well, thank you, Madam Chair. And um, first, I want to say thank you to uh, you, Madam Chair, and your team. Uh, over the last four years as Ranking Member and Chair of this uh, committee, uh, there are times we've worked together, there are times we haven't, there are times where we've uh, agreed in public and disagreed in private, and then other times we've done the opposite. Um, but I want to thank you for how we have attempted one another to, with one another to, to treat digital assets and the bipartisan work we have here. Mr. Ray, thank you for you and your team, uh, your willingness to participate today, and the forthright nature by which you've handled a hearing like this. Um, we know there will be ongoing conversations uh, in the new year. The title of this hearing was um, part one. Uh, part two will be next year. And uh, as chair of the committee, it's my intention to continue the work of Sherwin Waters when it comes to this matter. Um, we know more because of your testimony. You had uh, somebody who's a crypto genius, but behind closed doors was using QuickBooks. Um, we know somebody who was a pretender to the technology, but was doing everything possible to obscure something that is innately a transparent product. Now we understand why, a lot more of the why. Uh, we wish you well in resolving these matters and look forward to continuing the conversation. Thank you, Madam Thank Chairman. Thank you. Without objection, all members will have five legislative days within which to submit additional written questions for the witnesses to the chair, which will be forwarded to the witnesses for their response. I ask our witnesses to please respond as promptly as you're able. Without objection, all members will have five legislative days within which to submit extraneous materials to the chair for inclusion in the record. The hearing is adjourned. Thank you.